better know the same language that I'm using. Uh, All right, welcome everyone to the June 3rd, 2014 Shock City Council meeting. This is a workshop format this evening. Call the meeting to order. And uh, Ms. Linehan, could you please call the roll? Yes, Your Honor. Councilmember Lehman? Here. Councilmember Whiting? Here. Councilmember Mulkel? Here. Councilmember Lewis? Here. Mayor Tabke? Here. All stand for the pledge, please. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> all right, item number three, approval of the agenda. Do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda this evening? None from staff. Yes, Anything from council? All right, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Council Whiting. Make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Do we have a second? I'll like, second. Second by Councilor Mokul. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone, anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number four, consent business. Any uh, items removed from consent this evening? Council Lehman. 4C. Anything else? Do we have a motion? Councilor Lehman. Consent agenda as modified, removing item 4C. I'll second. Second by Councillor Luce. Mr. McNeil, could you please read the uh, consent business as modified? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 4 A uh, authorizes approval of a variance for the fee schedule for Valley Fair, reducing the 2014 fee for fireworks displays. 4 B adopts resolution number 7454, adopting, excuse me, accepting bids and awards a contract for Casaw 17 Verling Drive. Casaw 17 169 North Ramp Intersection Improvements Project Number 2012 6, including pavement rehabilitation work on Casaw 17 Ver uh, Verling Drive, Project Number 2013 5. Also approves a 5% contingency for use by the city engineer in authorizing change orders or quantity adjustments, and approves an extension agreement with Bolton Mink for construction engineering services for this project. 4C was removed from consent agenda 4D. Adopts resolution 7455, designating polling places in Shakopee for the 2014 elections. 4E, approves applications and grants on sale, off sale, 3.2 malt liquor license and Sunday intoxicating liquor licenses for the 2014, uh, 2015 year and waives the requirements of city code section 5.02 sub 9 for global restaurant groups doing business as Dangerfields restaurants, to, uh, Stonebrook Golf Club, LLC and Knights Columbus Homo Home Association Inc. 4F approves the application and grants a temporary on sale liquor license to the Shakopee Eagles Club for an event to be held June 7, 2014 at 220 West 2nd Avenue. 4G authorizes payment of bills and electronic transfers in the amount of $1,550,523.22 and 4H Authorizes the replacement of two tall drop slide structures at San Venture Aquatic Park in an amount not to exceed $30,000 to be paid from the park asset fund. Thank you, sir. Councilor Lehman. There, there's an updated uh, bid on the drop slides on the table that was uh, $28,040.80. We did not previously have labor included, and we got the bid on that uh, since the packet went out. It was 5500 on top of uh, what you had had in your packet. Okay, this is what was on the table when we got here. So the total cost is correct at $28,040.80. So we saved two grand. It was an ex not to exceed amount at 30000 so yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item number five, recognition of involved citizens by city council. Anyone out there has an item that is not on the agenda this evening they'd like to discuss? All right, seeing none, we're going to move on to item six, business removed from consent agenda, item 4C. Councilor Lehman. Uh, Mayor, 4C, the uh, increase on water softener and water heaters is going from like $15 to $75, which is a five-fold increase, which I thought was pretty substantial at the snap of a finger. And my question is, what can we do about that to not make it so sudden and sticker shock? And the second question that I asked these of staff prior to the meeting, um, Second question is, what is the square footage cost of the resident residential valuation, which are increasing most of them, one or two went down, um, and how does that, how is that figured and what does it go into the value of the property that's improved 
And how does I guess I'm trying to understand how the city council works. Okay, Mr. Leak. Mayor, members of the council, uh, Councillor Lehman did in fact talk to me and what I proposed to the city administrator is that we remove this item from this agenda and put it back on the June 17th agenda. With respect to the table, we will need to ask of the state what they use in terms of the formula for calculating those square footage costs. I don't know those right offhand and we can talk about internally whether or not the increase in the permit for water heaters should be staged over time. And we'll come back with that proposal on the 17th. Okay, we have a motion to table to the meeting on the 17th. Second. Second by Councilman Mokel. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Leak. Thank you. Item 7A, discussion of County Road 101 First Avenue goals in the last, uh, oh, there's a big deal. Introduce, uh, we do have some information we'll go through, but in uh, preparation for that, we'd like to introduce uh, Laura Pico of the Main Street Shakopee Group and uh, give you an update on information she's found in the time that she's been here. Perfect. Pointing to from an overhead? No. All right. Hey, well, thank you for inviting me to be a part of the discussion. My purpose for being here is to update you on the Main Street program and share some of the emerging priority projects that we've started to identify that this program can accomplish in this first year. And then third is to join in that discussion on the 101 plan and see how we all work it out together as far as um, the size of the district, etc. So, um, my exciting announcement is that on, so on May 2nd, we did apply to be a designated <coughs> Minnesota Main Street community, and that was thanks to the 101 plan and some heads being put together, so that's why I'm here, is the 101 plan. And then on May 27th, so last week, we, the Preservation Alliance of Minnesota came out and did a visit to Shakopee, and they came to review our application get a better feel for the community and what it would be like to have that program come here. Uh, they also explained some of the benefits of becoming a Minnesota Main Street community and we had a great turnout. It went really well. And yesterday I did receive an acceptance letter as a designated Main Street program with conditions. Yay. I know, it's like yay. almost yay. yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that we'll get these last few things cleared up either this week or next week. So it, I can, it's unofficially announced that we will be the seventh designated Minnesota Main Street community in Minnesota. Um, the one condition is just the large size of the district concern them. We took the size of the Main Street district of what, where we'll focus these efforts from the 101 plan. So that runs from about Speed Dog to Dangerfield for second and third avenue. And so we took that from there and we explained why it's large and how we'll communicate in the future. So we'll take that care of it, it'll be no problem. Congratulations, that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> it is, it happened really good. A month later, we're designated and it will really, the most important thing about that designation is that we will get some technical assistance in the form of, they actually have it listed out. They had some areas that they thought that we could use some customized training or assistance. and. Um, I have a whole list of them here if it interests anybody in, in the meantime. But in the essence of keeping it short and to the point, uh, I, I have started to do a lot of things with the Main Street program. I've talked with a lot of individuals, business owners in the district. I've read the 101 plan, possibly more than you, but I don't know for sure. <laughs> and um, just the general things that people have been buzzing about as fresh eyes into the community. Um, I will provide a full update to the council in July following quarterly statistic gathering that we're, that we're getting. So I'm gonna skip over kind of the parts of like everything we've been doing and get to the point of what we wanna do this year. So I've kind of synthesized what feedback I've gotten from downtown business owners, things from the plan, and also brought into factor what we can physically and financially <laughs> get done this year. And I've come up with a list of top 10 projects. I did print them out if you're you kind of share those. Do you have a list of the conditions too? I do have the, I do have the list of the conditions. And 
Uh, well, uh, do you want me to share that with you? The one condition is just provide a method for volunteers representing the east and west ends of the Main Street District to be formally incorporated into the Main Street program's infrastructure to aid in communication. How do they become formally incorporated? Well, the solution that I will be proposing for that is we have a steering committee put together for the Main Street program. It includes two seats from the city, two seats from the Chamber of Commerce, two seats from downtown business owners, one seat from the Southbridge mm -hmm. area, one seat from the East End industrial area of the district, and one seat for a community member at large. So to build in the formal communication, we'll designate one seat from the city as formally as the 101 corridor liaison, and that will happen quite naturally this year. Samantha Caprio and Mike Luce are both on the seats from the city, and then we'll also designate our west end represent our industrial representative as a similar title. So having a form of communication is an incorporation. Yeah, it, it's just they want to make sure that we have a formal way to make sure that we're gathering information from the entire district and in including participation from across that whole area. Okay. Yeah, so no problem. <laughs> so we accepted and, okay, I just passed that out of our top 10. And these are, these depend on um, acceptance of our steering committee and, you know, it's just a draft. Um, but I wrote on the top, these are nothing new. This is the feedback and buzz that, ha that people have been talking about, especially the downtown business owners, our food, that includes um, restaurants, possibly looking at moving or incorporating a larger farmer's market into the downtown, a grocery store, a co-op. And this is an order of how I've heard them. So food is like number one, <laughs> this is from what I've been hearing. As it should be. <laughs> yeah, I'm all for that. Second is bikes, and that's one that I want to highlight because um, some of that was put into the 101 corridor plan, but you may not know there's actually a pretty strong desire, I would say, among downtown business owners to really capitalize on the fact that the bike trail is being completed and coming through. Many people have talked about wayfinding signs and signs from the bike trail and getting that bikeability piece in, and it's a, it's a strong interest from downtown. Signs are the third biggest one. Those are both street signs, um, also the bike signs. People talk about getting more variety of businesses, and then there was the fifth and most important, all general fixer-upper things. Anything from, I wish my sidewalk was fixed, to the parking lot over there has a pothole, <coughs> things like that. So those, that's nothing new, that's from the corridor. Um, so down to what I think that we can do to address these in year one is we're looking at doing these 10 things. Bike trail signs. <coughs> can I stop you there for a second? Yeah. Who's we? The Main Street Program. And so the Main Street Program is very community-based. We have the steering committee gathered and we'll be gathering four committees based on the main, what the Main Street Program puts forth from these, it's a national program governed by the Preservation Alliance of Minnesota in Minnesota. So they kind of put forward a blueprint for you to follow. And so when I say we, it includes the steering committee, it include, includes four of our main committees, and we really gather a lot of volunteers and community support, and it's really stressed in the Main Street program for people to participate and have a sense of community pride and involvement in all the projects. So I think that's maybe where it differs a little bit from the 101 plan. Um, so things that we'll target are the bike trail signs, bike racks, uh, there's some really unique artistic things that you can do with bike racks downtown um, that will beautify it as well as capitalize on that bike trail coming through and then we can do things through promotion as well. We can gather the downtown business owners and do maybe a retail promotion where we would say, hey, 10% off for anyone who arrives by bicycle, parks their bike in a rack on downtown. We can help organize things like that and then do retail promotions under the Main Street program logo. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot through these really quick and then take questions if that would be, if that works better. Uh, so downtown signage plans is, a no, is the third on the list and that's not to put them up, that's just to make the plan. That includes some of the stuff in the 101 plan like the wayfinding signs, this is off of Highway 101 and 169, um, but it's also maybe looking at placemaking signs as well, what kinds of things can we put in the downtown that um, point out historical significance or 
um, rather than just wayfinding, it's placemaking as well. So we want, it'll be, that'll be a bigger project and we just want to start at least having a plan for what we want it to look like downtown. Main Street vacancy signs is to address the business mix and encourage entrepreneurs <coughs> by working with vacancies and putting up um, signs that say, you know, imagine a blank here. And that comes from the downtown partnership. Other cities do things like this. And so I think that's an easy low hanging fruit that we can get done and um, help the vacancies have a touch of added, some <laughs> added something that looks nice and looks like we have an organized effort for, for getting some of these businesses in. We want to beautify the welcome sign, so landscaping around the welcome sign that's already there. And people have also talked a lot about beautifying the Holmes Tunnel in some way. We would like to update and publicize the design guidelines, not just for historical facade renovations, but also as a little reminder to business owners and building owners, some ideas for thinking about your facade and what is appealing to customers and people coming through Shakopee. And just make sure they have the resources in the fall, this is my favorite. I'm going through these really fast because <laughs> I know that this meeting is long. But uh, we want to put on a really fun pop-up event that focuses on engaging the entrepreneurial spirit of downtown. And this, again, is working on that business mix, maybe recruiting some retail or working with food. And this is a fun event where people submit business ideas ahead of time, and you host the event in a vacant space. Um, you make a big deal of it. It's it's going to be awesome. <laughs> if, if we have any vacant space. Yeah, by fall. <laughs> if not, we'll have it in the park. There you go. Yeah. You, and then uh, lastly, we can definitely do some of these maps and directories. I brought Oatana's to share where we have maps of Shakopee, but here's one that says downtown Oatana map with your restaurants and such. So we've actually already started on this process as well. And then number 10 is a question mark because it's easy to say top 10 and I only had top nine. And <laughs> <laughs> I know. A lot of space. <laughs> it's like all thought out and then number 10 is a question mark. No, I really put that in there because this is a draft list and we haven't, you know, this is the first, the 101 plan is going forward and this program is really there to be alongside and th the plan calls the Main Street program as the keeper of the vision or whatnot. As we figure out our roles, that's kind of why I'm leaving number 10 blank, is the steering committee may have some input. There might be some input from EDAC. So this is just a draft kind of thing. At the bottom are additional projects that would be nice if we could tackle, but um, we'll see. Beautiful. Um, so what we are getting together to work on tonight, the main part of the meeting is uh, so as we all know, a few months ago, we got together and talked about um, 101 Main Street, Shakopee now uh, goals and how we move forward and what the next steps of everything would be. Um, we had uh, got feedback from different boards and commissions, which everybody uh, on council here has that report um, with just kind of their priorities through that. So that was good that Laura started this off because a lot of the things that we have on the list are um, a really good start to these kinds of projects and the low-hanging fruit and the uh, uh, the things that we can get at now um, and, and get done so I think that's a really great way to start and before we get into a ton of discussion on things we have uh, staff folks come up as well and say well, you guys will be important in this conversation as well so Bruce Sam Michael Julie if you guys could come up Matt the uh Looks like a good start on this list. Nice job, by the way. But Thanks. I assume we want where we can to get partners in, involved in this. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So when we look at bike trail signs and bike racks and maps and directories and stuff, I'm thinking of the Scott County legacy dollars <laughs> being spent on a trail that's coming down Home Street. Okay, And the signage they're going to put from 10th down and how do we incorporate our signage to match their signing and sign these bike routes yep okay. then I'm looking at the DNR trail along the river saying where does the DNR fit in this to mark their trails the same as the county trails and the city trails so that there's uniformity and and maps and directories do we get the kiosk areas that show where these trails go so that somebody on a bike can plan out 
you know, I'm gonna take this 20 mile loop or whatever the case might be and know where they're gonna come out. So how do we coordinate with all these entities and get the biggest bang for the dollar since they're already all there in place? Mm -hmm. So I understand that actually a lot of this information has already been compiled and tried, you know, trying to make some of these signs happen. And a lot of it just recently came across my desk. And now I think it's kind of a matter of Main Street stepping in and being like, hey, we can be the, we can be the people that help push this through, go to the right meetings, talk to the right people, get the right grants uh, to get some signs up. <laughs> and then Mayor number 10, question mark, I wrote in parking because if we're gonna have more things going on, we're gonna need more parking. And that doesn't necessarily mean we need more parking. It may mean we need to utilize the parking that we currently have better. Case in point, you know, if we've got a big event going on here, down, downtown somewhere, and there's nothing going on in Eagle Park, we've got all kinds of parking there, we just gotta figure out how to utilize it better. Or maybe we do need more parking. Mm -hmm. so I went ahead and wrote in parking under number 10 too, so that's, uh, once you mentioned, a good idea. Um, I wanna thank you, because you've done a, a great job in such a short time, and I uh, still have a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, and that's great. Um, I like your idea of using these bike trails. As I drive by the bike trail that's being put in along uh, 101 there, and see that as something uh, very exciting, and can bring a lot of uh, potential bike business down to Shakopee, and, you mentioned okay. signage and way signs I think is important, but I'd also like to maybe think about uh, you know, the directional signs like uh, Councilman Lehman uh, mentioned, but also some advertising sign, maybe bulletin board signs so people know what's going on in town and what's, uh, where, to go to what sh where to go shopping and different things like that. So uh, good, good work though. Thanks, yeah, and these are all pretty much precursor projects. Mm -hmm. Like we've been calling them the low hanging fruit where they won't interfere with any large projects that take place in the future, and they'll just kind of add these really nice pieces as we go along and work into some of the bigger stuff. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, Laura has kind of covered, and we're, I think it's gonna be, there's gonna be a lot of gray area as we go forward, as I think there really should be with, uh, especially with this project, as everybody is trying to find and locate where everyone's role is um, and where the overlap is because there's going to be with this project more than a lot of other projects there's going to be a lot of overlap between uh, city and council and chamber and main street Shakopee and and with everybody so I think there needs to be just to make sure everyone is cognizant and aware of that there's going to be some give and take there and figuring out exactly where everybody fits in and what everybody's role is. So with these 10, um, nine that you've put forward so far, Laura, what, what city involvement are there that you need from us, if any, on these things? Like where, how can we help with these items if you need us? Well, I mean, these will be going through the steering committee and we do have the two members from the city on it. So when I was thinking about this before, a lot of these things were based on, you know, what we can physically and financially as the Main Street Shakopee program uh, accomplish. And several of them, so the bike trail signs, you mentioned the legacy grant, there's additional grants for bike sign. There's, a, there's more grant money available for like park related things and things that get people moving and healthy and walking. So that one, I feel like we can go towards grant money. There are a couple things like maybe bike racks would go under city territory that's right on the sidewalks, things like things of that nature, just making sure that we're staying in communication about how it's happening and, and how to get it done. Um, espe and especially on the bigger things like the downtown signage plan, like the wayfinding. I know that's maybe something of interest for, so I'm focusing on Main Street, but that's something of interest for all of <laughs> Shakopee. And I know that the sign ordinance has, brought up, has been brought up before, but have, being somebody new in the community and knowing that wayfinding signs are needed everywhere and not just in Main Street Shakopee, um, I just hope that you know I'll continue to be at the table for those things as we pass them along. Uh, other things, the Holmes Tunnel, I know there's the anti-graffiti paint. Well, was I supposed to say that? <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I think it's okay, yes. yes. It wasn't like unveiling right. something new. Nope, you're all good. 
Uh, so <laughs> it's better than anti-artistry. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that, you know, where I would like to add a, I'm always wanting to add something with character and flair. So anytime there are these, these projects, we might look at, a, look at it from a, from a city perspective of like, well, this project needs to be done. I'm always going to be at the table being like, let's do this artistically. Let's do this with character. Let's add something that makes it really fun for people. And then I'll also add the promotion piece. Does that kind of answer the question? I guess it was long-winded, but there's <laughs> certain things where I think we'll be at the table more often than when we do maps and directory and a pop-up event. One thought I've had too is I've noticed recently using the trails more myself, how many people are out walking and running. And I think I want to let everyone know that they're open for those activities as well besides biking because I often see people running on the streets and I'm thinking, you know, they're so close to the trail, I don't know why they don't get on the trail. But I have to wonder how many people know that the trail is truly there and how far they can go. And so it'd be great even if we had some fun mile markers. You know, you're one mile into Shakopee or you're two miles into Shakopee or something fun like that that went along with it as well. So. Yeah, or historic signs. I agree. And that's, there's another, there's this park ranger that somebody from the Preservation Alliance of Minnesota, they were great. They had so many good suggestions for Shakopee and what to do in the program. So one of them suggested working with park rangers on some of the interpretive signs that they will put up in parks and thinking of how to put that, a historical twist on Shakopee and hmm. make it interesting as people go along the trail. We'll have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so from, uh, what I think I would like to do from here um, does anybody have any questions for Laura on these couple items that are on here? Um, it's hard to think from a council perspective long term. Um, let's talk about what we think are the most important things. So if, if you look at the, the list um, that we have for the top corridor goals that came from uh, our advisory boards and those kinds of things, what are the big things that we as as a council and as a city want to look at that are uh, not just right now, but also long-term kinds of things. What do we think are the most important ones that we should be uh, checking out and planning for? One thing I wanted to mention too is that when the EDAC had reviewed this, they broke these down in that sense, but also in a sense as whose responsibility is it to do these things? So are some of these things that we could ask Laura in the Main Street program to do? Or are some of them more of a vision statement rather than a task that's going to be done? Or are some of them really something that the city needs to take care of? Are they more of a city function? So I don't that's know if you want to think about it in a similar fashion. Well, I'm really glad that Laura was here to go through these couple things first because that gets some of that stuff out of the way so we don't have to talk about uh, beautifying Holmes Tunnel today. That's a done deal. It's going forward. It's not our issue um, in, into the future. Matt. Well, I think we're going to have to figure out a way to improve access between this side of the highway and that side of the highway. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're talking the microphone. I think we're going to have to Beans. we're going to have to figure out a way to access between downtown Shakopee and, and Huber Park. Not only Huber Park, but the trail and the, the old mm -hmm. bridge and the river and these types of assets. Somehow we got to figure out how to get people across there safely, besides the tunnel and the stoplight. So the connectivity of everything? Yep, we need that. We need the signage. Um, well, and I think the signage is twofold. I think it's our sign ordinance update along with the Main Street programs stuff. Um, w I think we can't really leverage the riverfront until we have that access. I mean, we can leverage it, but we just can't utilize it effectively until we have that way to get across. Um, and what does that look like for you? You know, I'm not an engineer. I'll leave that to Bruce, but uh, maybe it's multiple points with them kiosk type things telling us where these are. Whether I, you know, the tunnel is a good opportunity, mm -hmm. why don't people use it? Mm -hmm. They don't know about it. Yeah, well, nobody knows it's there. Maybe they don't know about it. Maybe they've got perceptions that, you know, there's hooligans in there or whatever. Um, we don't really have a lot of access points designated. We've got one crossing here with a stoplight, but can you do, can you access it down at Scott Street? It's a very good access on levy there. You can get right to it. There's not a whole lot of traffic, but nobody really knows it's there. And you can take it to Chaska or you can go the other way to wherever you're going now. So I think we need to create these points of where we want to direct a lot of crossing activity. We did that with Scott County when it came down uh, Home Street here to utilize 
the tunnel. Mm -hmm. What do we do that direction? What do we do that direction? Where do we make these crossing points? Do we make it at Marshall? Do we, do we make one at Memorial? Where I think we're putting a trail crossing somewhere underneath that bridge by Memorial Park. So I think we need to figure out where we want them. How do we educate people that they're there? How do we envision them actually working and, and what's the capacity and these types of things? So we're just gonna have to work through it and figure out what it is and, and make it happen. Then we're, we're able to leverage these the utilization of the river space because it is a kind of nice space. Um, we need to continue to promote the industrial park, the business park area. Well, let, let's let's fall back there and let's focus okay. on connectivity and have a discussion okay. about that because I think you're absolutely right. I think that's one of the number one yep. things. Um, we did a few years ago a walkability study. Um, did anybody else do that? Mm -hmm. Anybody go out on the walkability portion? Does that, Michael, does that have anything good in what came out of that study that we could utilize for these kinds of things or is that a totally different thing? No, I think there were things in that study that are usable in this context. Um, and they ranged from things like um, having the depressions, the crossings at intersections located so that they're easy to use, to talking about potential ways of crossing some of the areas along 101. So I think it would be worth pulling that study back out and seeing how that may fit into what these thoughts are today. Um, I'll also suggest we did some things, unfortunately, I'm going to say years ago. I think it was the first year I was here. Through the then mayor, I proposed that we have a system of wayfaring signs all the way from 83 or Marshall Road and 169 to 69 and 169, which tackles a number of the areas we're talking about. And one of the nice things about that is I'm not certain it requires changing your sign ordinance. The amendment that's going through really doesn't relate to Main Street or 101. It related to the 169 corridor and the businesses along there. But there is a provision in the sign ordinance that says we don't regulate governmental signs for direction purposes. And perhaps even without tweaking that language, that's sufficient to allow those kinds of things to occur as long as the council plays a role in deciding where they're going to go. Do you still have that wayfaring, wayfinding? Somewhere I probably have the then hand-drawn plan. Um, I don't know if I can find it, but. If you can, I'm sure it would be helpful. Um, other items on connectivity, Sam. One thing that I've had people bring up to me is when you're leaving the park, it feels like you've really left the park and you walk into a parking mm -hmm. lot and then you don't really realize that there's a tunnel straight ahead. So that some people have said to me, could you make it feel like the park continues or have that journey be fun to continue that walk along so it doesn't feel like you've kind of come to a spot and then stopped? Because that's kind of, it is how it feels. You know, if we, if we had something fun or made it into a fun walk for families and kids or something that would get them to continue walking, I think would be interesting. Absolutely. Like the history walk. Right? Almost like a history walk that could have you know, that was one thing that we talked about. We could get some neat statues or something they could read or something that the kids could play with to learn on the way, some kind of educational game along the way or something like that that would pe keep people and parents walking and more people in that area. All right. Michael? It, just along those lines, um, I know some of you are well aware of it, but we do have a walking guide, and in fact, the map that we do did contains those districts. Now, in the past, um, conversations about signs on specific properties didn't work. But having that kind of historic wayfaring in the area, because we have, I think, roughly 53 to 58 identified historic properties in this area that have been cataloged and are in that walking guide in printed form might be an option. So you could point out, for example, on one corner that on this block you've got four structures, they are X, Y, and Z that date back to this time and they're important because of whatever. Mm -hmm. Different approach than having a monument sign or even a front door sign on each of the properties. Perfect. We were just in South Dakota on our family vacation and we stopped at one of the rest areas and it happened to be a Lewis and Clark rest area. And they had some really interesting facts about the Lewis and Clark expedition. And so it, the kids thought it was fascinating on how many different animals 
you know, that they found on that journey and how much something cost and they had different stuff for the kids to look at. And I know they went through the entire thing and read all this stuff and I thought it was really a great idea that kind of to relate it to kids and if that's who we want to draw down there. But then we could also maybe potentially draw, as I've noticed more recently, that there's a lot of adults in that section of the park and maybe not as many kids. So that's also something you might want to talk about is do you want to make that section of the park more adult friendly and less kid friendly? Is that the park overlooking the river up on the hill? So it would be as you walk in your in your in Huber Park and you the face. One in South Shore. Oh yeah, you know it is up on the hill. You're right. It is the Lewis and Park. The river. Yep, it overlooks the river. It's stunning up there. <coughs> Sorry, I thought you were talking our park where I was talking about. <laughs> I'm with you, Matt. Up the hill. Up the hill. Yeah. yeah. All right. So connectivity wise, are we is so we've got walkability, which we have a study that will crack out as one thing that we can do that way. Is there anything else um, to, to connect fr across 101 that was, that was part of the study that was done that we think would help? Matt? We need to think long term if we're going to utilize the old bridge for any purpose, how to access it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's to access. Do we want the access to be over there and come back half a mile or right there so it's convenient or where do we put it and once we figure out where we want it then we're gonna have to look at alternatives to make it happen well, there's a crosswalk at Scott I think it's got some there at the, the old bridge you said oh yeah well yeah you have to go past it to get back I think. right but do we want that to be the access mm -hmm. point for for it or do we want it to be farther away or differently mm -hmm. I mean if you use a tunnel then you're stairs mm -hmm. right depends on what we're what we envision yeah. using it for and maybe it's benders of some sort steps aren't going to be the option then right. so well i was surprised to find that from when you cross at scott you can't easily and it's definitely not ada accessible to get to the bridge from so there no sidewalk, is you've got to go down onto the back side onto levee and then under and then go under the bridge and then back up the ramp i was right. surprised and that it and I think that's one thing that we need to work on uh, with connectivity. Another thing <coughs> that I would like to do and see as something that we look at as part of the uh, downtown renovation portion of things, um, but having some sort of a designated pedestrian crosswalk across at uh, at the light right out here um, to go across to Huber Park. So have some sort of overhead canopy that is a big welcome to Shakopee kind of thing um, that still you cross at grade, but that it makes it feel like it's where pedestrians are supposed to cross. Because I think that when, at least when I cross that street with the kids, um, it feels like you're going to get killed in the middle of cars sometimes it's a really large expanse of asphalt and um, it doesn't feel like I'm supposed to be crossing there with the kids right. and so if we had some sort of uh, canopy overhead I think of uh, Louisville Kentucky has a big pedestrian area downtown um, that is where pedestrians are supposed to be and it makes it feel safe and it makes it feel um, uh, comfortable to walk across the street that way. So as we talk about what we're going to do downtown, that's something that I'd like like to see us do. I don't necessarily need it to be a bridge across because I would never, I would be too way too lazy to take a bridge across 101. Um, Matt. Well, and I'm not far away from you, but the point I will make is that your idea on this side is fine, mm -hmm. but you can't access that old bridge from this side because the new 101 goes out and you'd have to cross that also. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what you're thinking is maybe one on both sides. If you so put one on this side, then you can <coughs> access that bridge. We need to determine if we're going to utilize that bridge and what we're going to utilize it for, and that's going to determine mm -hmm. the access to it. Right. I agree entirely. Bruce? Well, Mayor and members of council, we're talking about the old home street here, right? Correct. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. There is a sidewalk above, uh, you know, equal grade to where the bridge is. So you can access it from Fuller, or you could even go to Somerville, you know, probably better to go down to Fuller, cross, and then come back. You can then directly go on to that. It's just a one block. Is that really a sidewalk? Mm -hmm. There's a sidewalk over there. Mm. Oh. I've always thought that was just part of the curb because it's like this wide. <coughs> no, it's wider than that. 
Okay. Through our lights in the sidewalk, those make it feel narrower. Okay. So, but it is about six feet wide. Okay. So you can get over there. So you can actually walk and access. Also, if you went underneath the tunnel, mm -hmm. you come out of the tunnel underneath, and there's a head ramp up on the other side that brings you up to the bridge. Right. So there's really many ways to access the bridge. If you cross at Somerville, you got to cross the new bridge. The new bridge, which is right. probably a good way to go. Yeah. But what I'm thinking is, let's say we have a weekend or <coughs> event where you have vendors lined up on that old bridge or some kind of event like that, where you're going to have a lot of people coming down. You're really not going to run them across here or under the tunnel, up and around and over and back. They're going to want to go across. Mm -hmm. They're going to want to cross. Yeah, I did. I uh, um, left from City Hall and went the ramp down to go into the tunnel and then under and then the ramp to go back up and it was almost a half mile to get across the street from here to there and I was surprised that it was it was that long. I think the tunnel is great if you're going to be at the lower level and not go up. Right. I mean, it's a good opportunity. You can still go up but the tunnel eliminates every bit of risk with the highway. It does for park utilization, getting to the riverfront, taking a yeah. DNR trail to wherever you're going or, if you're or gonna whatever. If you want to uh, utilize the bridge, I would say put parking on the op on the north side of the bridge, down by the archery range. Let people access the bridge from there. Then you eliminate the highway. There is parking there now, yeah. Yeah, but we could expand it. Put signage there. Yeah. Put signage to the fact that the you bridge is there. And there's stairs to get up to the bridge from there. Well, you don't even have to use the stairs. You can, I believe there's enough slope in the hill you can probably well, I spend think they're a while. extending that trail down there too aren't they well that will it'll be interesting to see that when, when uh, the, the bridge ends, goes across when the bridge goes through it's going to connect up to the trail up there so there will be a connection from the parking lot down there up to the right. to the north end of the bridge It'll go straight no? down to not, the old access not the parking lot we were talking about the archery range no. yeah but okay. we could come up with something possible you probably have to add something yeah you know, it, it may and I know we got that entrance into downtown, but that home street access to the old bridge, if there was a crosswalk there, I, I just don't know. Mayor Bruce, do you think that's even feasible with that entrance there? On home street? Mm -hmm. No, I don't think. You have to go back to Fuller. Because uh, the home street really is the tunnel. Yeah. So it would be tough to access that. You'd have to go back. The to county Fuller. would never allow that. You have to go through the signal in Fuller. There is a sidewalk over there. Now, whether or not we have to expand that, maybe. To talk what Matt is saying, if you have a large number of people and you want, but that would be the way you get to the bridge on the ground level. If you wanted to go underneath, underneath the highway, you have to go into the tunnel. But there is a ped ramp. In fact, I had to argue for that ped ramp. The state did not want to put that in. Oh, really? Right. Why did they take the stairs out? It ticks me off. They took the stairs out because there used to be stairs there. Well, because it didn't meet ADA. Mm -hmm. <coughs> huh. It actually is a hazard. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, all right. So connectivity, we've got three bullet points so far. And correct me if I'm wrong here. We've got walkability study. We've got utilized historic bridge um, and the crossings across Marshall Road. So the Somerville lights um, and others, if possible. I know that the Luz del Mundo Church has talked to me multiple times about crosswalk and connectivity there to get down to the playground. Mm. Um, and what's that? Fillmore. Fillmore, is that that one? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and how we increase the connectivity across that side. Michael. Um, just a couple of things that we might want to consider mining for potential ideas. Um, I know it goes back away, but there was a study in 94, I believe it was, that focused on this area and some of the connectivity issues. There may still be some worthwhile ideas to look at there. And also the study that went into the 101 reconstruction. There was a lot of analysis of potential crossing points in that. So we might want to just touch base with that study too. So uh, quick, quick add, uh, during Derby days, uh, everybody okay. wants to cross at Fillmore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like a, a hot spot. Uh, and, and also Spencer, of course, but uh, um, Fillmore is a good one too because it goes right into the park. Now, it, would the county give us a hard time if we requested some sort of crosswalk there or uh, a lighted uh, crosswalk? Is that What do you think, Bruce? Issue? Would they uh, give us a hard time? Well, <coughs> funny you should ask. <laughs> um, we are dealing with several crosswalk issues 
and, and it, is a, it is a big issue because multi-lane um, crosswalks at non-signalized intersections are potentially very dangerous. You get one car that stops, next one doesn't. So, I mean, it is a p potential problem area. Um, there are things that we're looking at. The county's reviewing their crosswalk policies and what supplemental measures we might have to do. I mean, you just can't put paint and signs and say that's good. Mm -hmm. That's probably not a professional safety thing to do. We probably have to do something more, whether it be a, a signal like it's on 17 with the junior high or some kind of flashing light when somebody hits the button to let people know there's somebody crossing. But you have to do more than just paint and the striping or signs. Well, with the future traffic levels that they're talking, you know, we have to be very careful about yeah. people crossing that street. They would probably Kathy. say it's safer not to put anything in. Well, I think my concern with the Derby Days point is that it's not just the people crossing the street. You already have congestion from those cars because you're trying to make traffic flow as well. Mm -hmm. So I think <coughs> some of those crossings are going to probably inhibit some of that traffic coming through because if they're hitting that button every time, there's no cars going then. So there's flow both ways. It's well, not just pedestrians, but then the There's a couple cars. things I think we need to really uh, separate or think about when mm -hmm. we talk about traffic and pedestrians. One is a big event. You usually don't plan, you know, like even Canterbury when they had their um, big uh, concert. You don't, you don't design a roadway right. to meet that need, that one or twice or three times a year need. You don't do that. You look at the general need, the general reoccurrence, both for pedestrians and vehicles. That's one way to design it. The other way, how do you handle a big event? Well, maybe you have police um, help out with the traffic. I mean, that's where you're, that right. would come in. The, where, you know, the few that's times why I was saying with, yeah. with the button for people to cross the street, and then you're yeah. uh, derby it days, it's going to be on you know, the whole time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And another approach, and we used it one time with Huber Park and with derby days, um, you'd have to look at it again is we actually set a destination I believe it was the junior high school the middle school for people to park and we ran buses all day long mm -hmm. um, because Bruce is right I mean you go to the uptown art fair or Edina art fair if you're successful like Matt says and you've got vendors on the home street bridge you're never going to accommodate that vehicular and pedestrian traffic without conflicts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so can you provide some relief valve in addition that's one potential re relief valve. And if it's once, twice, or three times a year, it's not really that costly to do. Didn't mm -hmm. six or eight people end up riding the bus? Yeah, I think it was seven. Yeah. Seven? <laughs> no, we actually had substantially more than oh, that. Oh, was it really? Yeah. <coughs> oh, that's very good. Yeah. The I problem was during the flooding, we didn't have anyone riding ah, the bus. Ah, okay. Sam. I guess I have two questions. Number one would be, is there a way that we could work with Derby Days to hold more of the events not necessarily in the park. Could we hold more on this side of the highway to keep less people from crossing and maybe then encourage them to use the tunnel to get underneath there or something like that? Interesting history goes along with that. And yeah. then my second thought is is, is uh, one thing that I'd like Laura to check into, and I know they're coming up more and more, are called pocket parks. And so I'm curious as far as the, near the location by the church, is there potential for another small park somewhere over by there so that the children from the church don't have to go that far to get to a park. Is there another, or maybe it's just, maybe there is one over there and I'm just not sure about it, but you know. That's a Hiawatha, I'm sure. Yeah, so that's something that I, I would also like to look into is if there's numerous people in that area that have the use for the park, I don't know that crossing that street with the children on a regular basis is that great of an idea. The only, right. thing, the only thing missing on your list was Samantha's idea of the stretch from the park to the tunnel, make ah. it attractive attractive somehow. Mm -hmm. But as far as Derby Days is concerned, they have had discussions about uh, the tunnel and somehow we need to figure out how they can advertise and sign and encourage people to utilize that tunnel. And part of the conversation I had was if they, s you know, maybe on the other side of the tunnel and enter the park from the tunnel on the, on the west side to the trail and they set up their ticketing and raffling and whatever else there now you have people coming this way picking up all their stuff entering the the event and maybe coming back out picking up right. any prizes or whatever out the same way we tried to, an event like that during the 150th celebration where we were trying to get a sponsor for one of those chalk artists to do a big chalk drawing so we had 
kids, we couldn't afford that, but we had kids doing chalk drawings down in the tunnel just to get people to down there <laughs> to, to <laughs> use it. So that's what I was going to pipe in. As I said, this year, that's one of the things that we want to do for the Main Street program is find a creative way to help publicize the the way that you can get to Derby Days through the tunnel, which kind of solves like, you know, helping pe publicize that the tunnel is there. Um, so I'm going to pitch an idea to Derby Days for something that we can do. And we'd like to, and it's no secret because I've already posted it all over Facebook. I said we're looking for pedestrian pedicabs, bicycle pedicabs or bicycle rickshaws um, to give people, it's a fun thing to add to it and then try to give people bike rides through the tunnel. We'll have to dump them at the bottom of the tunnel because we can't bike up the ramp. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll say, hey, at least you know that the tunnel is here and then there's that parking lot further on home so maybe trying to publicize it and I know now that you've said that you've tried to do something like that before and like get people down that way um, but it, it'll help it'll help you know bring more attention to the area and more attention to the idea of adding some interesting place making signs on the trail etc I was picturing the pedal pub in a crash down <laughs> it's just only like two people in two people can be in it yeah. Yeah. it's not that big <laughs> All right, and so we've, got, safety training. we've got a few things that we've put uh, bullet points on connectivity. So we'll we'll circle back toward the end here. Let's get to another main point. Is there another thing that folks have pulled out of this study and the corridor goals that would be a big long term thing that we can or should be talking about? Well, we have the big elephant here with the reduce the negative impacts of the rail line, which we've had a lot of discussions on. And does that impact uh, our access and, and does it con conflict? That's uh, one of the questions of walkability and bikeability. Um, we don't know, I guess, until we look at that further. But, um, so let's look at that further. Yeah. What, well, uh, I mean, we haven't really given much go ahead to do a big study or anything like that. Do we want to do that to figure out? We've talked about it, but we haven't actually. <coughs> allocated money for doing a train study. I, you want to go ahead first or should I? I think we need to give it a little more time. There's some things in the works and I think we might be surprised very shortly. So I think just let, let that one where it is for right now. And, okay. And I'll say that, uh, you know, we're asking the Bruce and the consultant to look at the FRA criteria based on national statistics of what the corridor would have, what this corridor, train corridor would have, would have to have in order to qualify for a no whistle zone. Um, it could be sprucing up existing crossings in a certain area, or it might be other alternatives that could be less desirable and work against walkability and, and, and movements. But until we have that information of what the minimum requirement is, and the cost of that and the potential maximum and the cost of that, I, I guess it's premature to know mm -hmm. where we're going. So my question is, how do we figure out where we're going? Well, and we're in the process of getting that information. Okay. And then we can bring it back to the full council and say, here's what we know so far, where do you want us to go? All right. This feels very cryptic. Oh. I know. Well, we'd be premature to jump the gun right now and um, it probably needs to be cryptic at this point. Okay. So we've got train question mark, question mark, question mark. Uh, well, as number two? It's not really cryptic. It's it's the FRA study or their website. Mm -hmm. Bruce could probably explain this better than me, but there there's X amount of crossings in Shakopee from uh, what, Sarazon, is it, to the private one on the other side <coughs> of 3rd Avenue. 15, yep. Okay. No, it's when it's... Behind Steve Hendricks' no, that old many buildings. Crossings. And then there's a distance between a crossing to the next one, I think it's a half mile or a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. That if there's one within that distance, the next one has to be included also. In order into your, your area for the quiet zone. Well, what is the minimum that you have to do to all of these crossings to make this number in this corner box down here on their tally program? be a certain number to qualify you as safe enough okay. by the national standard. And that certain number has to be safer than it is at this point in time. So. All right. And they use some national average. Yeah. So 
what we're in the process of doing is looking at all these crossings that we would have to do something with and figuring out what it is we have to do with them, all of them, to be the minimum to be eligible to even be considered for a quiet zone. Okay. And, and what does that cost? If we, example, if we find out that the minimum that we have to do is put up fencing all the way down our community, well, that's going to harm your, your walkability. It, on their position, it may make it safer because where people cross are now going to be at designated crossing places, but the reality is there's entrapment issues, there's, you know, limited it's space to cross, and what's the visibility of that in your community? All right. You know? So we're, we're working through that. We're trying to find out what their matrix is and what the minimums are and what their costs are and cost participations and what the maximums might be, and then we can bring all that information to council and say, here's what we know. You guys give us some direction. Where do you want us to go? All right. Um, all right, so another thing. What else from this list do we want to discuss this evening? I have, I have one question on, you know, we, we really want to do the bike thing, and we talked bike racks. What kind of liability do we have if we're supplying bike racks and somebody stumbles over and gets hurt? Uh, it's the same liability as you have with your curbs and any other infrastructure sorts of okay. things. So we're covered for that. It's not to say that somebody isn't going to sue because they did something awkward, but that's we wouldn't put street lamps up because somebody might walk into them and bump their head. So it is. Yeah. No, I just look too as to the placement of them. You know, they do take up a fair amount of room. But if we're going to use uh, the trail, we're going to need something for people to secure their expensive bicycles. The, the other thing, I mean, you don't want them locking them to street signs and things like that because that also poses a hazard. This at least keeps them in one location. Um, if you look at connectivity, we're talking back and forth across the highway, but the bike trail now that's being constructed down to the Bloomington Ferry Bridge will also increase your connectivity east-west, mm -hmm. uh, going all the way over to Chaskin, well, actually down to Fort Snelling. So that's something else to do. The Main Street Loop has identified signs, has identified uh, bike racks, but there's other things that we can do. Uh, Matt and well, Matt would remember uh, three or four years ago the debate that we had with uh, Three Rivers about doing a designated bike trail down Home Street mm -hmm. here. I don't know that we've had any traffic issues as a result of that, but that's part of the connection from basically so, uh, Southern Scott County up to the trail. We need to build on that. We've got a you know, business across the street here, which is a natural for that, but we've got support businesses downtown in terms of uh, restaurants, bars, those sorts of things, which are also uh, being improved on that. Uh, one of the things I'd like to be looking at doing is getting Shakopee a designated bicycle friendly community. Uh, that looks at everything from uh, bicycle parking to designated lanes. We don't necessarily have to lose parking lanes for that, but there's a lot of things that cities can do. There's about uh, half a dozen or a dozen in Minnesota that are designated that way. Now, we've got a natural with the bike corridor down here to build on that. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. so you mentioned you've got a natural for the logo if we want to use them. <laughs> Got to use the recumbent, that yeah, recumbent that bike. Yeah. Um, so it's with the me. with the uh, with the bike racks and a couple other items that are on this list, the uh, um, outdoor plaza space for downtown events, the outdoor eating. Uh, there were another couple. I, I, I was going to ask about that one. On here. Well, I think that all kind of goes together into one larger uh, streetscape mm -hmm. plan kind of thing. I know I've had um, some downtown businesses and and other folks talk to me about cutting off all parking in downtown, just making a pedestrian area. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of that, but it's something that I think that we should look at is the, the downtown streetscape and having room to have a, a farmer's market or a splash pad or things like that in on first um, through that corridor and how we um, do that. And so I know there is a, a streetscape plan that's been – thought about in the past is that correct Bruce no no I thought there was something that was up 
a while I mean, ago. Not in my mind. All right. But, um, but well, we did it. The streetscape down here was in the 87, 88. Right. So we just did an overlay on most of the streets down here. Um, we, I mean, we, I think we're all talking long term here. Are yeah. We talking mm -hmm. the next I'm not two talking years? about tomorrow. Yeah. No. <laughs> At some point, every street needs to be redone. When is that for here? Right. That's a good question. Um, like I mentioned before, a lot of the street lights are going, but it doesn't pay to replace one at a time. We just move them around because we have a lot of excess. But down here, we all our head ramps are not for standard. They need to be upgraded, and they're cost they're costly to put them in. If we did them one at a time, they're about a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred dollars a piece. So we would everything I hear tonight in my logical engineer mind says we need a plan. Mm -hmm. An overall plan that integrates everything you're talking about because you just can't talk about walkability here and then you can't talk about train whistles here and you can't talk about streetscape here without an overall plan that fits everything together to the goal that you want to achieve, which I believe listening is some synergy. Whether you have bicyclists, walkers, or businesses, you want some synergy for the downtown. Is that so how Would do that we, be a good way of saying it? Mm -hmm. that, and that's exactly where I was going to get to after we got a couple more of these flushed out as to what we wanted to see happen is how do we, how do we make it all work together and how do we make it, um, because like the, the pavers and the uh, tree grates and things like that are, I mean, mm -hmm. some of them are sticking up an inch and a half in places and there's nothing you can do because it happens. We can, we can go and fix them. But well, that, we can that, that'll fix be them. A, that's a Band-Aid over what you want to see if you have an overall plan that says this is right. what we want to do. I would rather have a solution than just a, a yeah. short-term fix. We'll, we'll still things. maintain the downtown and fix those things that need to be fixed. So what does a long-term solution look like? And I guess this that's is both question. for you guys. Well, a couple of thoughts about that, and I'm not thinking like an engineer, <coughs> which I know probably drives Bruce crazy. I, I think it requires actually doing a plan, but to start that, I think you need to identify based on the previous discussion, where, for example, key crossings are going to be to make that connectivity. So you can narrow in on the geographic area that you want to take a look at. Some of the things that relate, for example, to outdoor dining, especially in the downtown portion, from a zoning perspective, are relatively easy to do, although you do have to deal with the issue of those outdoor dining areas might be in your city right of way and what are you comfortable with respect to that? But I think it really requires resurrecting, doing some careful thinking about how you do that, identifying key connection points, where potential concentrations of businesses are. And we do try to do that to some extent in our comprehensive plan even um, in the downtown and First Avenue area. Before you can make specific decisions about what you're going to invest in. Let me just give you one example that I harp on. We've got something called River City Center. There are, to my way of thinking, in and around River City Center, four spaces that you could revision um, as potential small plaza resting areas. Where the sign is is one of them, and that's fairly substantial. The east end, that is grassy now, but doesn't have anything else, is another potential. Um, there's the central entrance area, which kind of gets used by folks who live there and not a whole lot else that I see on a day-to-day -day basis. And we've talked a lot about the tunnel, which is largely concrete and gravel, and there are ways of making that more appealing on that end, not just on the north end, to use the tunnel and making it a public space so that you've got some places where the public can rest and where they get a particular aesthetic impression of what they're living in and what they're enjoying just from the areas around them. Right now, those spaces weren't developed that way. Mm -hmm. But I do think it needs an update. You know, I mentioned the 94 plan. There was some attempt to identify how you would make those steps work together. I'm not sure it was the right plan, but that, I think, is the kind of thing that we need to do as a next step to see how it will fit together and for you to make decisions today and tomorrow and into the future about so my, my the uh, sign on the east end there that you were talking about is very inadequate. I mean, you don't see it until the last second. You can't turn that quick. Mm -hmm. That sign needs to be moved in uh, a block down if it can be. And then 
Yeah, make a plaza out of it. Yeah. That was donated by the downtown partnership at the time, and they knew the minute they put it there that the lettering was too small. Mm -hmm. and, and I might say I spent a few years with the downtown partnership, and every year that was a topic of, of conversation. No one could agree about what to do with the sign, <laughs> except Don McNeil, who agreed with himself about what to do, and then there were a lot of other discussions. Their intentions were good, though. No, the intentions were great, and there are some potential solutions that were talked about. There just wasn't enough consensus or funding to do what they wanted to at the time. On the west end there, too, with the uh, uh, limestone outcropping that's by the tunnel, if we could make a seating area on top of that, if it's feasible with the condition of the outcropping. I know it's deteriorating somewhat, and I don't know how quickly that's going to occur. I think don't you'd mentioned a splash pad to me as well, didn't you? Uh, no, you mentioned that oh. to me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Cliff diving into the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I might mention an example. I'm sure many of you, like me, have gone um, to River Place and the Stone Arch Festival. And the entrance into the main plaza area is somewhat analogous. The materials geographically are not the same but there are seating and more attractive areas along that entrance along the hillside. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about trying to do with that. Right now, you don't even see that there's something there, so that means you need to do signage, <coughs> as well as something at the street level that makes it appealing that people want to explore once they get there. Well, I think lighting is part of that. You know, we are talking about new lighting, um, and you want to direct people to where you want them to go, limit the lighting in the crossings where you don't want them to be and increase it at the tunnel on uh, Scott Fuller. or excuse me Fuller um, increase it there so it's it's basically daytime all all the time they're going to be more happy to go that way right. than go to one that's a little less lit Matt Mayor I'm thinking you know how do we incorporate the walking the biking the driving because you kind of need all of it down here to, to sustain your businesses. And uh, how do you get them all together to work in that synergy? And I don't think we're gonna have any problem with bikes coming down Home Street and using the tunnel. It's the bike that might be coming from this side, getting them to that tunnel and, and getting them to utilize that tunnel. You know, they might, I don't really see them coming down First Street this way because the only access to that would be off 101 or possibly down uh, Somerville. Uh, and that would get them there, Lewis and Somerville. <coughs> but there is it a matter of signing bike route this way and steer them Second Street over to Holmes and down? Uh, that could be part of it. You're gonna get your trailer every now and then that just wants to take First Avenue, and it is what it is. But at right. least you know we did our part by putting the signing signing up to say this is the route you want to go. Um, the the walking I think is we've got sidewalks all the way downtown, so I, I don't think that's an issue, per se. But the outside dining, you know, we might have to make some kind of concession to allow, you know, the restaurants and the bars to be able to sit out front at a table with chairs and have a little thing up and have your burger basket or whatever. Well, the issue with that, there's not, the sidewalks, there's not enough space to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, there's just one spot and that's under the, where the clock tower is there. That's basically the only spot where outdoor dining could work um, in the, on first and things like that. So I. Maybe it's a job for our Main Street program to ask the uh, restaurant tours how they think they would well, go about actually, that. Actually, I do have some unique photos gathered about outdoor dining spaces because food was the top, the <laughs> top buzz. I have some unique ideas as far as like, there's some things that, um, it was actually in Des Moines where they constructed a kind of like this movable platform that actually went, uh, I, it's hard to describe, I almost have to share this picture with you and since I've seen it, so it, it butts up against a curb and it looks like you could actually move it if it was a parking problem in any situation. You can kind of like it make it beautiful. It's like a movable patio that butts up against a per mm -hmm. curb. And so I've been walking downtown and thinking about spaces like this, like where could we put something like that? Where it's not part of the long-term streetscape plan, but it's something that I think maybe can help lay the groundwork. And as you something talk about, seasonal. So yeah, something seasonal. Two park installs, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think St. So Paul did that. 
and actually, I, and they're kind of protected so that you can't go out into the traffic and vice versa. It kind of has a, looks like a retaining wall around it. Is that similar to what you saw? So that nobody can get hurt, nobody can fall into traffic, it's but not, yet you can it's, move it, like a trailer on wheels that you can... Kind of, yeah, kind of. A little platform that yeah. it bumps us up to curb height. Yeah, and so I wanted to interject here too as well, like, um, to prepare for like a larger streetscape plan, that's the kind of feedback that I would want from the city as well, or what kinds of things that the Main Street program can be doing to prepare for it, whether that's like identifying for sure these these pedestrian areas that make that we've noticing that people walk the most or during events, you know, keeping an eye on that without having a large study done. So we'll have our dis really nice district maps made, and if it makes sense to start overlaying some stuff on that. Um, I have photo archives going, so I'm taking shots of, you know, places where I think something like this movable patio could go, or places where, y if that kind of thing is helpful as a preliminary to the streetscape plan. Couldn't we let the then businesses let me, let me have know. the affordable patio option at their discretion instead of the city doing it? Yeah, I'm not saying the city should do it. It was just one of the ideas allowing. for as the a city solution. just allowing right. it. Right. Allowing yeah. it. Right. right. You'd have to allow it in the parking spots. Right. I'm glad you brought that up though because I think this is something that as as we're looking at our main street area, it does go from RAR all the way down to Dangerfields. So we're going to want to make sure that access is good along our entire main street area, not just in our <coughs> core downtown is that not some I mean I'm assuming that's something that that's one of the things of the Main Street program is to make sure that you could walk and bike and use your entire area and I know I'm sure KFC is hoping that more people could easily walk down there for lunch or to other places in our district so I just want to make sure that as we talk about that that we figure out what area it is that I mean I'm assuming you want to use your whole Main Street but I want that to be something you think about as well I, if I may I think Sam makes a really excellent point it goes back to that 1997 plan in which someone analogi analogized Grand Avenue to 101 into downtown and in that corridor you've got businesses that have sprung up that create the synergy that makes it more of an entertainment destination you already have properties in the corridor to the east that are vacant. Could adaptively be reused, for example, for restaurants. Now in those cases, you probably have the opportunity to work with them to provide those outdoor dining experiences uh, as a part of their business plan. So what you're talking about is a great interim step for the businesses you have yep. here. But if you really want to have a destination, you're going to have to expand beyond the B3 zone. Mm -hmm throughout that corridor and there are opportunities to do that. You've got one service business that has already invested in the corridor. There are lots of opportunities for that to occur all the way down to danger fields and you need to make sure that that can happen. But that can be part of a longer term plan and as I said, zoning can do a lot of things pretty readily if when I bring zoning changes to you, you're okay with them. That hasn't always been the case but especially in this corridor, it's relatively easy. Um, because we have already made changes that say, for example, look, you can do businesses and residential uses in the same place. You've got a pretty small lot requirement even along the 101 corridor. You can play with that. Some of those properties I'm referring to, like the house that's on the north side of 101, have several lots associated <coughs> with them. So you can work with that kind of thing. But that needs to be part of a little bit longer term plan in addition to the interim plan for how you address those needs and wants at this point. The other, Mayor, the other access for businesses farther down um, besides the sidewalks and the highway would be points on the trail of where you can actually get off and come in from the north going south. Um, years ago, when I was younger. <laughs> so that was five years ago? Right. <laughs> we would bike down behind the old Dairy Queen and there was an access point off the trail to come up to the Dairy Queen. Mm -hmm. I think we the kids made that access point. <laughs> <laughs> but it functioned beautifully. But it did and it was wore in pretty good and it was became a permanent function. You know, and we could do that with places where we have access points to our main sewer interceptor down there to come up off of there to get us to Bluff or to one of the side streets and, and you know, some signage this exit off the trail takes you to Perkins and SA or whatever. Yeah. You know, which Matt, is there. Matt makes a great point. Uh, let me just note that the CDA has a project called Bluff Avenue Townhomes. They've got property that could 
pretty readily be used to create an access from the trail and from the river to that east end of the corridor. And I know that Bill Jaff in the past has talked with me about a willingness to work with the city to make that kind of connection work. It's not there today. <coughs> um, there also happens to be a small park that's a part of it, so that's not a bad thing either. Right. But yeah. those are the kinds of opportunities Very to take a look at. Very small things that they get done. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And those are the low hanging. Yeah. Um, all right, so we talked about streetscape things. Um, I mean, we'll need to do some major things in the near future. What kind of time frame are we looking on that kind of stuff, Bruce, for the for the lighting and for the sidewalks and that kind of thing? Five years plus. Okay. I mean, it all depends what everybody else wants to do here. I mean, I can keep things going for at least five years more. Okay. Um, we, we've always talked about getting rid of the brick probably going with some colored concrete if we were to keep things as they are but it sounds like we may be changing things so we don't want to spend a lot of money if it's going to get ripped out and redone the lights would keep moving them around as they deteriorate um, but at some point they're going to look pretty sparse and they look pretty ugly especially like the ones at the court tans where we cut off and leave a cap on there you know it's like where is the light you know there we go Jeez. what'd you do with the light so at some point it's a street sculpture yeah it is a street sculpture <laughs> So at some point, it, it's going to be painfully obvious that we need to do something and redo the downtown, um, do the pavers, do the grates, do the lights. But if we're going to modify the parking and modify, I mean, that's going to be a major project. It's not a Bruce. I have a question about the alleys because are you? Is that the plan to wait five years to do the alleys? No, as I'd well? like to get a concrete alley program going. I talked to the mayor uh, today about that. Um, that's something we've had in our in our um, capital improvement program but we just need to get it going like what what is we, what's the actual program how much do we assess what if we assess at all or how do we pay for these things and what's the criteria that we're going to use for people that want to have an alley or the city that wants to have an alley done because concrete alleys the bituminous doesn't hold up on all these roof drains in the downtown area do we, do we so talk about about that being part of the storm sewer fund yeah. because yeah, it, it be is a storm sewer drainage. okay so basically it's a curb and gutter Inverted crown. It's not 100% stormwater, is it? It, um, it could be. It I mean, could be if we, we want to, this? or if we want to say, I mean, right now our policy is 100% petition, 100% assess yeah. for any bituminous pavement alley. Um, we don't get many petitions, so we don't have many bituminous paved alleys. I think if we reduce that requirement, then we get the people who are really interested, and we also say we reduce the 100% assess to something reasonable. I mean, I've talked to a lot of people, a resident, $1,500 for a concrete paved alley to clean up their alley. A lot of people will say, sign me up. Yeah. And if you don't say, sign me up, then we don't do that alley. I mean, we don't have a bigger problem. We talked about this last year during the 2014 budget planning, and we had talked about bringing that percentage down to 25%, putting it out over a 10-year assessment, and providing people that impetus to get this alley project going. At that time, we said the funds could and mm -hmm. in other communities do flow through the stormwater. It's a logical process that that would be something you want to raise as a higher priority in this budget process. Well, th there's three blocks of alleys that I'm thinking of in the downtown <coughs> corridor. Uh, but I think the policy would apply to those All across the board. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. right. Yeah. yeah. So, so we, have to, we have to generate that. Po we have to get that policy to right. Would be for for a paved or j a concrete? Concrete. I would if you're say. If you're going to do it, you're doing a concrete. Yeah. Concrete. And, and again. The concrete alleyway is serving as a drainage conduit, right. mm -hmm. and some of the some of the alleys we really need to extend some storm sewer right. to make it work better. Well, I guess my question is, if we change that policy on how we assess that, would that be specifically for concrete alleys, or would we keep it 100% assessed for the ones that petition for asphalt? I would say we wouldn't want asphalt alleys anymore. I'm leaving. You're talking anywhere in town. Mm -hmm. anywhere. I think if you, have you one want it, if you want a policy. paved alley, it's going to be concrete. Right, and the consistent policy is much more defensible. I would recommend. Right, no, it, it is. But the blacktop just doesn't hold up to no. truck traffic. Mm -hmm. and no, I'm just talking though residential. I, the right. block across from me has it, and they've been doing very well with it for years. Yeah. All right, this is a program that'll come back to us. We'll yeah, talk more about it that time. Do you um, want to integrate so that into the 2015 budget plan? I think that's what we talked about last time. Yeah. Is that? We need to look at the policy. The policy, yeah. Mm -hmm. for Bringing that part as far as the budget. And yeah. What, integrate it in 2016? Or begin it? 
we could. 2015? Well, can we yeah, have we could actually start in 2015. We integrate it into the, uh, <laughs> for the, for the policy. I, policy discussion. Yeah. I bet we could fit her in there. Yeah. All right. Policy. So I've got two things I'd like to cover yet. So, Michael, with um, planning for the downtown area, what you said there are multiple studies we can look at from the past um, for doing that. I would like to see something happen for doing a refresh of the downtown corridor in the next two to three years. I mean, in my head, I was targeting 16, 17 for doing something fairly good size um, for that area. I don't know if that's what anybody else had in their head for targeting or what do what do folks think? We'll answer that question first. I would like to see the old studies before yeah. I made that decision because the, like Michael says, there was a lot of good things in there we can integrate those and then we can kind of get an idea of how far out we have to plan them. But that, we need, in my opinion, we need to know where, when we want to, we need to have a, a time that we want to get this done, in my opinion. Um, and we can do things at any time, but I think that there's, it's more than just piecemeal thing here and piecemeal thing there, like Bruce was saying. Um, I think that we need to target a date so that we can know when to work toward. Plan toward. Does that make sense, Mike? Are, are you talking like a streetscape redo? Yeah. I would like to see it in that time frame. Well, I'm hearing we got about five years of life left, so I would be looking at about five years. Mm -hmm. I understand that we've got five years of life left to it, but does that do what we want to get done for the downtown area? Well, I think uh, in the next two or three years, we're going to be implementing the Main Street program and a bunch of these things that we're talking about. And we need to see how all this plays out. So any things that we have to, <coughs> to build off of what we've already done can be incorporated into whatever streetscape we put in. And they that put the streetscape in and, and find out that, darn, we should have put this in too. Yeah. And we didn't. Where are we sitting, Julia, with the budget for doing some of the street streetscaping? That has not been brought. That has not been brought into your 14 planning. We had some early discussions at the time. Sam was relatively new. We did not have the downtown. Michael had had a lot of history that he was bringing forward, but there really wasn't an overall conceptual plan of let's make 2016 the year. I think that's the piece that's missing. As a council, direct when and how you see this as a priority. We'll blend those pieces in as you see fit, and we'll move ahead. What's the cost on a plan, and, uh, and how much time would we need to put something like that together? Just the planning pr process of it. Well, we need to ask, Mayor, if I can, we need to ask ourselves, is there potential for the property owners that are affected to uh, appeal their assessments on these improvements, uh, justifying the cost-benefit analysis? That's always a possibility. So <laughs> <laughs> One yeah. question I had, Julie, too, is is it possible to use a TIF to create a TIF district in this area and use the funds generated from the TIF district to use them for public infrastructure or no? There's so another piece of history there, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you'd have to have yeah. structural improvements above and beyond just facades and things okay. like right. that. So if there's a redevelopment plan you'd have to go through all those parameters of TIF and that that might really complicate we, we did use TIF in the 80s that was streetscape and all the TIF laws have changed right that so was at a time when you could pool TIF for those kinds of purposes yeah. that's no longer the case um, no can, can I make a couple <coughs> of suggestions in terms of just those plans that I've referred to or that others may have in mind I think bringing forward a summary of what those are getting the council to have some discussion about what they see as a needed refresh to that kind of planning can certainly be done in this year. And you might want to set the parameter for when you want to get it done um, after that. It should certainly be part of the budget discussion mm -hmm. because I would expect at a minimum we'd be looking at about $50,000 to do a reasonable plan right. for a relatively circumscribed area in the corridor. Um, so we would need to plan for that. I, I would suggest you'd want to at least talk about doing it, perhaps even in 15, to set the stage for individual decisions that you're making, even, for example, uh, the ADA crossing piece that Bruce talked about. Which ones do you want to do first based on where your connections are? 
as opposed to streets where there aren't a lot of traffic. So we can bring that forward certainly within the next few months here in 2014 so you see what's done and talk about what you need in terms of a refreshed plan that gives you some guidance um, and then you can make decisions about the time frame from there for that planning. Sounds good. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we kind of have our priorities. Uh, oh, there's one other thing I want to talk about. The, a big part of uh, the 101 corridor study that was done talked a lot about residential um, and programs for um, rehabbing residential homes that are in the downtown district. Um, uh, purchasing parcels of land to aggregate parcels of land um, to create usable lots and those types of things what does council feel with regard to those and increasing the residential density and quality of residential housing that we've got in the downtown area what do we want to do that direction so define that area again see if I can abstain from the discussion or <laughs> what you said till third third Avenue to the down, the Bluff Avenue, I, I didn't area? define the area okay. specific. I mean, that's that is what it is, uh, particularly in the study. I think it's from third Placing to first, uh, third to the river. Mm -hmm. it, it, it um, just generally described the border or uh, boundary area around the downtown. So yeah, that the older stock of larger, smaller, of dense smaller. housing that needs to have some upgrades in order to continue to keep it uh, viable. So basically, like a exterior improvement program that we have for the businesses for houses in that area is that something we as council want to look at and and budget for 2015 or where does everybody think jay i think we have done some of that in the past and run it through the carver county cda correct me if i'm wrong we had some sort of programs that yeah. were used and they were helpful i think to some of the elderly that needed to fix up their homes and it, and it helped yeah and if i might that was part of a community development block grant um, award that was made to the city and we just closed out that program I would suggest that it would be good to have administration internally um, I personally and professionally had some issues with the administrative costs of that program um, but I do think it's something you can take a look at in terms of whether or not the City Council wants to invest in it We don't we currently have a facade improvement program that uh, residents can utilize? No, we no. don't. We closed. It was actually not a facade improvement program. It was a residential rehab program. It applied to internal improvements as well. That funding is now closed out. There okay. is no more funding in that account. So either you'd have to find another source for funding or the city council would have to identify, as some communities have, some amount of money that they want to dedicate to those kinds of loans for that program under cdbg we had a limit of fifteen thousand dollars for improvement loans um, i'm not sure if that's the right amount but that's one of the things that you talk about okay two questions did we did we use our eda levy dollars for that and then the second question would be uh are the residential properties on first avenue uh, legally conforming so that they can refinance today uh, let me take the second answer um, because we changed the zoning ordinance years ago now mm -hmm. and they have been legally conforming ever since that change so they can refinance without that was the reason for the change to yeah. facilitate mm -hmm. their refinancing to the best of my knowledge since we made that change we haven't had financing issues we do once in a while get a bank that says <laughs> you're in the b1 zone and we say guess what the b1 zone says they are a legal conforming use because the house was constructed before this date and we've gotten past that issue really quickly okay. so all of those houses are legally conforming along that corridor now and have been as i said for a number of years okay um, with respect to the first question all of the funds that were used for residential rehab mm -hmm were federal funds community development block grant funds none of them came from the eda level. okay right. could we could we use portions of that levy for this purpose that might be the question for you that, that obviously we don't have a funding source right now and that would be your policy decisions whether that's where you wanted to put seed money for that to uh, do residential rehab 
And as you recall, when we've had the last couple of years of budget discussions, there are issues with the way the city has in the past done an EDA levy. It's, it's not at this point going to function like some of your older levies. I mean, it's been many years since you had a true EDA levy. So what you would do would be just somewhat different this go around, but that's technical, so we don't Which need to Which we don't need to worry that. about today. Okay. Uh, so this side with regard to residential, um, first the residential rehab piece, and second, um, purchasing and aggregating land. Sam? I'm open to purchasing land as long as we do it um, with a willing seller. I don't want to use eminent domain at all. I agree with you entirely. Sam? I think one thing that I worry about is having enough money in that EDA budget to do all these different things. And so that would be something that I would ask you to consider in the future is if you want to have these programs, I'll gladly oversee them for you, but I just want to make sure that we have enough funding. And one thing that we were talking about housing is I know some of the downtown buildings have potential for housing above them, and some of them aren't being used right now. So that might be something that you might want to consider would be to try to allow more funding to be able to have more housing in the buildings that we already have. I know that there's some older properties that have some vacant, vacant upstairs, so that would be interesting as well. Just two quick things. Uh, just to go back to that first issue, the ordinance amendment, Matt, that we made was back in 2003 and it identified houses that were constructed and were zoned B1, constructed before December 31st of 2003 after we looked at the housing in the area. So it's now been 11 years that we've had that change in place mm -hmm. and haven't seen any issues. One other thing to Sam's point, remember that in this corridor outside of downtown as well, zoning allows for residences in connection with permitted uses in the B1 zone already. So you've got an additional area where if you were to see someone privately want to develop a property with both residential and commercial, that can happen in that corridor. Okay. Kat? I would like to see doing the residential rehab fund again. I mean, I think with improvements, like Sam said, with the properties above already existing pro properties, you have facades, um, I think that we need to look at doing another program with that addendum. Matt? I'm against buying property unless we know what we're going to use it for and we right. agree that we're going to use it for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But to just buy it, sit on it, and not know what you're going to do with it, bad idea. I agree. All right, so I've got four main, I've kind of whittled this down to four main action things that we've gone through tonight. One of those, um, and again, correct me if I've missed any major things or if I'm off base here. One is uh, re-look at previous plans um, for the downtown corridor. So bring those back um, um, to city council to look at those plans and see what they look like and what we like, what we don't like, what's missing, those kinds of things. A second one is to look at zoning changes along the 101 corridor um, for what we can do to uh, spur development and, and make some things happen that direction. Uh, a third one is a look at a, uh, a plan or figure out how to develop a plan for purchasing land, where we want to strategically do that, um, what makes the most sense for the city, um, and have a plan and a purchasing program in the budget for 2015. And then the fourth one I have is a residential rehab program um, to look at that as well and bring it back to council. Jay. Can I add one more, at least a discussion point? Um, some of these older buildings are required to have the fire suppression systems upgraded, and that becomes kind of a drag on trying to get the economic development down here. So I'd like to take a look at, um, of course, I know the fire department won't agree with this, but taking a look at somehow uh, getting around some of those zoning and uh, um, building codes like I believe Savage has in some of these incidents. Let me, let me try, Mr. Leak, but I think unless you modify the existing structure by 50% or more, you're grandfathered in. No. I'm trying to research that. As far as we know, nobody is grandfathered in. Really? Well, then I agree with Jake. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, Sam is actually <laughs> working on this program as both, we speak. Both yeah. Sam and I and my staff have been working on this Perfect. program, and 
I think the approach is not to get around the fire code, but to identify where the balance is for those kinds of buildings. And I know that there are other communities, Sam has researched one or two of them, where those kinds of accommodations have been made. So that's the discussion I think we well, need to have. I, I think that for me though, I you know, you look at St. Mark's Church when they had their big fire and they had to put all that in. Is it really fair to go on and allow other people to have very you know, those things stepped aside, but yet you require those businesses to do it? That's something we'll have that's to discuss. That's a question for you folks. Mm -hmm. that's Unfortunately, a policy discussion that's the we'll tough have. one. Mayor, we that didn't we didn't really discuss what kind of zoning changes that we're looking for on the corridor. Thanks for that. Um, Commissioner Robbins is behind me and he and I have had a discussion. One of the simplest things that I've come up with that I think we can do is, you may know that we have a zoning code that's exclusive. And I know in your next item, you've got someone who suggested an even finer separation of commercial uses. Um, one approach that many zoning codes take is that they are cumulative. So you can have zoning districts We've got basically the R2 and the, the B1 in the downtown and First Avenue area and the B3, of course, directly in the, the downtown. So for those I2 properties, you can say you can do whatever you can do in the R1, you can do what you can do in the R2. Maybe you decide to rezone it to R3 or B1 and say, by the way, you can also do what's allowed in the R3 and the B1 zone. So that opens up a great deal of flexibility to use property. It doesn't require the city to guess as to what a developer wants to do with that property if you leave open the option. So that's one potential zoning approach that's fairly easy to look at at least, and if it were approved would make a number of the properties in the area more flexible than they are today, and actually do away with the issue that we had to address in 2003. But doesn't that, so if we zone it I-1 or I-2. Not suggesting I-1 or I-2. Okay, what are you suggesting? I'm, I'm suggesting you could look at zoning, up zoning property that's currently R-2 to maybe R-3 or R-4 or even B-1 and saying in this identified area, the First Avenue corridor in downtown, you can do single family residences, you can do twin homes, you can do attached housing, you can do commercial. And by the way, you can already do commercial and residential together. So that's one potential approach to get okay. to sort of what I know was an interest of yours, yep, yep. The which mixed is use zoning. flexibility, mixed use yep. um, in the corridor, so. Perfect, and we can talk more about that when it comes back around. Yes. Um, I thought I heard like an industrial zoning and then you could down use it for lesser uses and my concern there. I would not honestly. open up the industrial okay. question <laughs> downtown and on First Avenue Kathy. other than by RAR. I was just going to mention and maybe this is more for Main Street was the governmental signs. Michael was going to look into that for Laura I believe. I'm sorry you're going that way. The Sign governmental signs and whether. Well you had said yeah, when we talked about the, the And I 169. won't pull it out but the, the ordinance basically provides a list of things that are not regulated by the sign ordinance mm -hmm. and governmental signs are not regulated by the ordinance. They are expressly permitted as a result of that. So the question is where you want to put them mm -hmm. and if you're okay with them being in the city's right of way and you can get the county to agree them with them being in the county right of way because we have a big ton of county right of way. Um, they are not currently regulated Okay. Governmental signs, as far as you know, established by the government, or are they specifically focused on governmental issues like park or city hall or something like that? All right, so you're are, making me pull out definitions. No, nope, well, are, that's we just are, the question. Uh, oh, yeah, we're going to run out of time. Let's here. think about that because we're, yep, gonna we're not going to get that it's deep it's into it. Basically, the question. a sign erected by or with the approval of a governmental unit for governmental purposes. Okay. So perfect. I'll call. Like, I'll call you. And don't okay. yeah. work that one out. Don't tell me. All right. So <laughs> it's already in the place to utilize. Yep. I have the state of Minnesota coming out this month to talk about a redevelopment grant program. This program works that you can purchase a building. If it's a building that needs to be demolished, they have a grant program that will help you purchase the building, demolish the building, whatever needs to happen. They'll pay up to 50% as long as you redevelop it within a year. 
I have a particular property in mind that I was going to bring them to, but after listening to you tonight, if you have any properties that you would like me to have them look at, I'm assuming this is our one shot to get this grant. So I want to make sure that we would all potentially agree on what property. So if you have any properties, that might be something you might want to touch base with me about. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. All right, so we've got the five items. Is everyone clear on what those five items are? Um, if we can work those into the work plan that we approved last uh, month, I think it is now. Um, and then we can have those worked into there. Is that clear, Mark? I believe so. All right. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I think this is a really good start. Thank you very much, Laura, for all the work you've done and all the work you'll continue to do. Yeah, and nice. uh, it is a, a very, very great thing. So uh, with that, we'll move on to item uh, 7B. So seven. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. We'll let folks leave. Could we um, have recess, please? Make Absolutely. A motion for yes. Uh, yeah, actually, 7B, I would pretty much like to skip oh. for this evening. Um, okay. It's idea box goals and things that are in there. I just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware that these are coming in and there are things coming in. Um, in the future, I'd like them to run through the activity packet and just run. So if anybody sees themes developing or ideas that you are extremely passionate about that you want to explore further um, then we can bring those to council talk about them at a workshop session um, into the future but just want to make sure everybody knows that those are coming through from residents and it's being utilized and to as people talk to you about things encourage them to use the website for those items Did, Matt motion to uh, ten. Ten take a break for seven minutes ten, <laughs> ten minutes sorry All right, I'll second that motion and seconded uh, anyone uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Pass unanimously. We are uh, in recess for 10 minutes.
All right, welcome back everyone to the uh, Shakopee City Council meeting. We are going to move on to item number 7C, which is review, discuss, and establish uh, city council goals. Um, and these are the directives that we started a few months ago. Um, we got two and a half or so done, um, and we need to uh, finish that off and, and move to the next. We have, uh, we as a city council adopted that we'd have five of these done before July. So that's where we're at on this, and we've got two and a half so far. So Julie, mm -hmm. she's yours. Yep. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as you see on the overhead in front of you, when we met and began this process in early February, there was a detailed discussion of what, what is the focus? What is this whole concept of what you want to put out as far as a message and a guidance as we prepare for the 2015 budget process, as you make decisions on the activities that are in front of you? The entire quality of life issue really focused as a overriding theme. Then Council uh, agreed that the promoting a unique and historic downtown corridor as a destination with a focus on economic activity slash viability and livability. I think you follow through on that as you've seen your discussions recently at the previous work session, at tonight's work session, at the work you've done at the Main Street program. A lot of this is, is coming into play. The uh, item on C, plan for and fund asset and infrastructure needs. I think there's been little discussion as to any concerns or questions about that. Uh, again, that has been a real focus during the 2013-14 and will be in the 15 budget issues. Because you are being approached for a lot of infrastructure and asset needs such as the community projects you're discussing, your discussion at the uh, school last week, working issues between parks and other groups. Those are fairly clear. Where we ran into a bit of a block was on item B. And there was discussion, and I guess I'm opening it up to the council. As a consensus, can the group live with B, ad adjust B? Is there something on there that does not fit where you see your actions as a council going for the community, for the planning for the budget. Are there things in B that you truly want to address or is this a statement that is within the work plan that you can go forward with? Yeah. So this is just, Julie's running this piece. I'm just talking. Mr. Layman, go right Didn't ahead. we achieve that by adopting our um, economic development incentives? package I I agree with you I mm -hmm. think what the item B says is exactly what I think you're doing well which I is why I think the goal is a I fairly concise statement of what you're doing let's go I'm sorry I was just gonna say let's go back to what we're working on here that uh, the economic develop the incentives program that we have is a task it's a tactic it's a, a thing that is being done what we need to see out of these overall policy directives are the overall umbrella that rules them all. So uh, these are a set of directives, and so that falls into it, but it also, I mean, the economic incentives program uh, falls into that. It also falls under the uh, asset and infrastructure needs because it, it meets those kinds of things. It also could, in theory, fall within the downtown corridor. So these are overall overarching very high level policies um, but that economic incentive one that you mentioned is one of the tasks that fit within that under that okay well that being said then I would say that as I did that wasn't displayed in the me meeting minutes from that meeting <coughs> at that meeting I pointed out that the quality of life in my mind is justified by how much of somebody's money we let them keep which what I'm getting at is a stable tax rate. It now, it's pretty quick to be pointed out that you know everybody else's tax rate is higher than ours. It's not bad to have a lower than everybody else tax rate. Matter of fact, I would argue it's very good to have that. Um, over at least my 13 years here, we've prided ourselves on a lower tax rate than our surrounding cities for multiple reasons. And at the same time, we've had, uh, very good fund balances, very healthy fund balances. We've increased our bond rating. 
Um, so we've achieved a lot of very good things and when haven't missed a financial reporting award in all them years. Um, and I believe it, it spurs some of these goals of, of economic development and livability because people know that the consistency of the expectation. So my, my main goal over the years has not changed and that's to keep a stable tax rate. I understand that when the housing market goes down and your tax capacity goes down and the dollar amount that you need to operate stays the same, that you're gonna have some fluctuations beyond your control, I get that. And as the city grows, you have to grow your departments to maintain a level of service, but you're doing that with more dollars from the growth that comes into the city. So I get that too. So it doesn't say it in here, but my goal is a stable tax rate and at some point I'd like to see us put together a, a cost cutting committee based on individual de members of departments, not necessarily de department heads, um, not to cut services, but to make them more efficient. There's a lot of good employees that have turned in a lot of good ideas. Um, it'd be nice to have a working group work on that to see how we can lower our cost through efficiencies without hurting the end result of service, um, thus maintaining a stable tax rate. Why are you looking at me? As a council, uh, I, I totally guess my, my question you, to you is, I, as a council, how do you want to turn that into a policy directive? Is that the message you want to put out in the 2015 budget planning as we're going forward? Um, and again, I'll play the devil's advocate, Matt. We've just sat here and talked about downtown projects that are going to consume money. We've just talked about issues related to the school that are going to consume dollars. We spent more time talking about alleys that are going to utilize funds. We've talked about areas where there is an expenditure of funds up front before you recover some of the growth. We have been dealt in 2013 with having to deal with the areas over by Emerson and the other uh, industrial expansions. Those all required cash outlay up front before you recover the growth in the future years. Can you, for me, succinctly tell me how do you want to put that in a policy? How do you want to address that issue as to how you want to guide the budget? And as a consensus, as a group of the council, that's what I'm asking you as a council group. Can you pull together a directive to the community, to the staff, that you want us to follow for the budget planning? With that as a guide, is that a guide that you want us to track through? Well, I, I don't believe there is a cost associated with looking at past studies, or, and I don't think the cost of a couple of bike racks is going to break the bank. I, I don't think those are the types of discussion pieces we've got. What we look at is the infrastructure. When you're purchasing potentially land, when you're dealing with items that aren't in a current bu year budget, those are going to be impacting levies. It's the same issue when we talk about uh, any kind of uh, improvements that would require debt issuance. There's levies. Uh, well, I'm I just saying, if you are truly looking at an expansion of your capital infrastructure, your capital assets, your programs, there are going to be decisions that have to be made. So that's what I'm asking from a policy directive. How do you want to phrase that? So w do, oh. do we need to decide if we're interested in building a second sheet of ice or an expansion to the community center using cash reserves or before we do the budget? No. No. Okay. We're saying what is the direction that you want to use as your base as we plan for these discussions with outside groups. If you have a policy directive in place that guides your decisions as you meet these groups, that will give you the base for how you respond when you meet the numerous requests that flow across your, your council's desks every two weeks. Can I go ahead? Okay. Uh, you know, I, do, I agree with you. Um, that we want to keep taxes low, I think that's important. But there's a way to do that by uh, adding quality, you know, quality infrastructure, quality jobs. Uh, when we build the e economy by uh, having people want to come build here and bring jobs here, that even if we do incentivize it, it's money in the bank. You know, uh, it might take the 
12 to 16 years or, or eight years, whatever it happens to be for our uh, abatement or TIF program, I, I would hate to, to kind of put us in a box by saying we're going to keep taxes low just blanketly when we can do some things that create opportunity for businesses to bring their tax base here. I didn't say low, I said stable. St stable, you can do that by adding infrastructure and adding quality. Yep, and I'm not against business incentives <coughs> when, when we're getting something back from it. I did I did support some of the tax abatement mm -hmm. programs. Matter of fact, I supported the biggest one Shockey's ever done, which was the whole, Lake, whole Dean Lake project. That's not what I'm getting at. What I'm, I, I'm getting at exactly what was said in probably 1997 by Bob Sweeney to get the spikes out of things you create a building fund you create a capital improvement fund you do these things and you put money into it so that when you have to buy this million dollar fire truck it's not a hit on that year's budget okay so you can keep your tax rate pretty consistent so that the, the person at home sitting on their couch who pays their taxes with their house payment doesn't go geez it's fifteen hundred dollars this year it's two grand next year now it's back down to 15 mm -hmm. they can't plan their budget year to year based on what's happening from the city and the county and everybody else well we can only control the city stable is a key word so but how do we so you so it's stable um, we take a stable tax rate for example um, next year we know the property values are going to increase dramatically mm -hmm. in the community you have a stable tax rate and if, if we were to keep the stable tax rate for next year, um, we would bring in millions more in revenue um, mm -hmm. next year. If, if we kept the rate the same way it is, and not just a couple million, lots of million more mm -hmm. next year because our tax base has grown so much. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that, I, I agree with what you're getting at. Yep. I don't think that's the way to do it at all. Um, and not at all, but I don't think that's the way to do it because you're saying, so if we kept it at, what are we at, 40 something? We have about a 42 tax rate 42. right now. So if we kept it 42 next year, that's going to dramatically increase the amount of revenue that we're coming in, which isn't what you want to get at. What I'm getting at is we were at 36. In one year, we went up to 42, six points, mm -hmm. okay? And the average household, my house, you said my taxes went down. My taxes went down. The dollar amount I paid may have been reduced, but the value of the property was substantially reduced. So in what I really did is I paid 46 cents on a dollar from in taxes to my house instead of the 30, 36 cents. You're absolutely okay. right, but that doesn't really tie. But what we're trying to do is get back to the, to the 36. We can't do that in one, in one budget. So you, you It'll drop go back to thirty six next year. Oh, when you if when we, you take a yeah. look at the market our, value and the tax yeah. capacity, there is going to be a rapid reduction uh, because you're looking at 10, 12, 14 percent adjustments in what we're seeing as the overall. So my question, I guess, to you is because we could debate this back forth all night. I know what you're saying is keeping it level. We have a building fund. We have an equipment fund. We have the pieces in place. Last year you saw a jump because I requested you to actually fund a debt service levy that had not been funded for mm -hmm. since its inception. Those are the kind of issues that you sometimes play catch up on when you defer. And by keeping that tax rate as low as you did, you did it by not bonding, you didn't did it by not levying for the bonds. Now, playing catch up will kick you more than any kind of tax rate. And when you don't levy by trying to keep a, a rate artificially low, by not bonding or not levying for your bonds you've just made a catch-up point here and that's the point mm -hmm. I'm trying to make to you Paying this year we don't have to add that tax levy it's now in this year's we are getting to the point where that catch-up process is taking place but if you want to I guess that's my question to the council do you want to go back and make that a issue that you want to be back to a rate of the 90s or whatever year you pick and say that's the level we want to introduce to Shakopee and will that be your guidance for the budget? My thought is what if we get all our fund balances to a point where the state says we can go, we can't go any higher. That way if we do have a bump in the road, we're covered to a larger capacity. Right. And, at and this point, once we hit that mm -hmm. fund balance, then we back off on whatever we can back off. Correct. 
What we did in the past to pay them bonds that we didn't levy for was we took underspend of six, $800,000 a year, which means we had almost a million dollars a year of taxes we collected from our taxpayers in excess of what we actually needed to operate. And we took that money mm -hmm. and we paid down right. debt payments, right. which is not a bad thing to do. It's not but, a bad thing. But some of that, well. we didn't hire back people when they left and things and like that. And yeah. you also had no money applied to your capital improvement fund, which right. meant you were working with a balance this low, and we finally now built that up to the $6 million level to approach the 2014-15 plan. And we stopped paying some of our bills. I mean, we... That's, we no, we did not pay our bills. We stopped, we stopped paying off our debt is a better way to put right. that. Um, you didn't specifically levy for each we bond paid, issue. We paid the payments. We just used it from a different bucket. And you used fund balance. Yes, you we did. You used debt service fund balance. And I'm saying, yes, you can do that. But I do believe you did a little delay job that's now catching up. And this year was the year you ran out of money in that one debt service fund that needed $386,000. So I'm saying, I understand what you're saying, Matt, but I need to have a statement from the council. How do you want to prepare then for this year's budget? Do you want to maintain and hold a flat? I guess that's the question to you as a directive. How do you want to introduce that to the as a, as a consensus, what would you want to do? Is this something you want to do? Do you want to put this in a policy directive? I'd like to continue that debt service payoff and, and working in that direction. You know, um, um, levying that stuff is what the voters said we should do, and we avoided that. Um, I think that's, you know, I, I hate to raise the taxes, but that's debt we're paying off. Um, I think that's important. That'll put us in a better position in the future. We'll be able to pay them bonds off and then you bond again for a project uh, like that second sheet of ice if we, we can, well we can't bond for that one but we can bond for the city hall we talked about or some other projects that might come up so uh, so if we can go back to B that we've got up here mm -hmm. that last time we got together to talk about this we were at at the workshop we were all in agreement that this is right. what we wanted to do and then once we got to the meeting there was discussion about that's what we don't want to do anymore. I'm very comfortable with it, uh, with this item number B, uh, item B. Mm -hmm. I could is everybody else. I'm comfortable with. It. I could change a couple words, and I th and I think that Mr. Layman might be more comfortable with it um, by following a consistent practice of for determination of the use of uh, the consistent or the for the use of economic incentives providing opportunity to live, work in uh, Shakopee when. He can, utilizing economic development tools. Rather, I think he was hung up on the consistent oh, use of okay. economic development We haven't development been consistent, tools. though. Well, we weren't until we adopted our there, policy. Well, you thought we were always going to use economic development tools, I think, when our discussion no, came the second no, I, time. No, I, the, issue, the issue was we didn't have a policy. It was just whatever, and we actually adopted the policy that, you know, there's this many jobs, this much pay, blah, 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 blah. We had a mm -hmm. policy. We, we, we had a business subsidy had, policy. No, we, we, had, we, had, a a, policy. A, we had a tax incentive policy that was for, it was, it was job creation. It was wages, and it was a floor on wages, and we consistently used that policy. What we adopted dramatically, uh, I think, improves that policy, which yeah. we talked for a long time about doing, mm -hmm. but we always used, and we consistently used the policy mm -hmm. um, exactly as we had it. And we're not totally there. I mean, as we talked earlier, we have the sprinkler question, we have SAC credits, we have things which we, we've really focused on big employers and big businesses. Mm -hmm. What we're finding now is that we've got the second tier, the folks that want to come in and support those businesses that are looking at some of our existing buildings and can't afford to move in there because we've got code requirements for that. Those are also economic development issues that really should be part of this number two. You know, follow through on that. It's a task, but it's an important task if we're going to continue and be consistent. Mm -hmm. And I would like live pulled out of that. Okay. We're going to pull that out. Now, um, then, and then I, and Matt, as you were saying, it was by utilizing consistent economic development tools. Would this be something where we would phrase it, and uh, that's why I'm just I'm looking for your guidance, when utilizing economic development tools for a broad base of commercial and industrial ventures so that we do have both the large and the small. Would that fit more into a statement that would be agreeable? Can you say that again, Julie? There was the horn, so. 
Oh, really? We never had I, those I here. I can hear that more than I can By hear By utilizing so. economic development tools for large and small entities, or whichever term you want to use. I'm good with the way it is. If you okay. want to take out the word uh, live, why do you want to take out live? Take out live. Do you want to take out? Why consistent? do you want to take out no. live? I want to hear no, this. No, no, because uh, I'd like us to be consistent. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I want I want live out of there because I bel it the way it's it reads. It seems like we use economic development incentives for places to live in Shakopee, and oh, we might mm -hmm. and we might want to do Super that. Cool. I just don't think that that's this this directive. Uh, I think there should be a separate one for residential. Mm -hmm. This is simply economic development, and it needs to be clear on okay. that so and I guess when I put it out there I was putting it out there as we want to live here and we want to work here mm -hmm. yep. but mm -hmm. when I went and I, I know what I you're agree, saying though but now when I, get I went it. back and read it again I realized that that is to live and work could give the wrong direction as to what we want to do I want economic incentive to move my family to this house right here <laughs> right. yeah exactly we don't want and that it, and That's it could be interpreted yeah. that way you're right now I get so it, yeah. as a group if we took the live out left in the consistent uh, do you want to mention anything as to large and small entities, or do mm -hmm. we want to take that out? I don't think so. I think I okay. We're take that out. Are we all in agreement? We're going to move ahead with B as is. Mm -hmm. So I'll live with that. Okay. Now we're into three. Okay. Let's go to number four. Yay. Okay. Now again, focus being quality of life. Okay. I'm going to just shoot out some concepts. You tell me where you want to go with this. There are a lot of discussions we've had. You name it big one comes down to do we have the documents do we have the kind of uh, I guess guidance take the city code usable understandable retrievable workable anything that you want to deal with with that enforceable <laughs> huh enforceable <laughs> oh okay <laughs> that's a topic we could go into but we aren't gonna send out for breakfast um, we need to update our code yeah I'll get, can I give you a quick sideline update? I just spoke sure. with Jim Thompson tonight because we did do a meeting with that. We've met with his staff. They're working on a whole project of this base at Lake City. We're kind of letting them plow the ground, and then we're going to work nicely off of them at a Purpose. lower rate and Happy upgrade ours. We have a meeting scheduled in June to continue to plow through this because I agree it is an extraordinarily complex task. What does plow through this mean? There are so many parts of the city code that if you pulled it up online, it would be very hard for you to understand, should I use this, should I use this, which one's current, which, parts. Is, which mm -hmm. is, you know, mm -hmm. what precedes what, what overruns what. You can't mm -hmm. wash your car in your yard, but you can park a utility trailer that doesn't have an engine on, your, on grass. And look, it's just like, pfft. Just to be clear, you can wash your car in your yard. And in nowhere in our code, code does not allow it, but they can't. don't enforce that one. Well, they, it, okay. Okay. And, and that brings up an interesting question. Okay, you brought up a great, great segue. We can't enforce that. Okay, one of the issues that I think you will maybe hear across the board, and you're going to see it in growth communities, you're going to see it in communities that have a lot of issues where they're dealing with a lot of commercial growth, retail growth, housing growth, enforceability. One of the issues that I see facing council, and it's brought up by the initial discussion we had on the tax rate, is there are a lot of resources that need to be upgraded, updated, provided, so that a staff and a council and the accompanying groups they work with can address with the timeliness that people expect from us to do a job, respond to them, provide them with accurate and factual data in a manner that their expectations meet, which means technology, it means timing, it means coordination with staff, it means having people with the proper skills, it means having enough core knowledge within your base to be able to respond to the needs of the city. Do you want to bring something of this degree into the directive and how would you do that? And if you want me to just keep talking, I will. Because <laughs> I can do that. You know that. Well, you, you have to have a code that's not gray. I mean, anytime you come out with gray things, you open right. yourself up to multiple interpretations. And then you have your own enforcement aspects interpreting differently. And then you have the legal people interpreting. And it just makes a mess. Yep. It's a mess. Well, I think so what Julie was talking about was different than code, right? right. It is. Right. But the, but the place to start is with the code. It does come back because mm -hmm. you are dealing with, you have to have the staff on hand and the ability to retrieve 
and work with outside sources with those experienced <laughs> skill levels to bring a document that will work within your community. That means resources. After you, the last one we had, you said the code was one thing that you wanted to talk mm -hmm. about um, with this, and I think that's very, very good. One thing I'd like to see with the code is um, plain language in code so everybody mm -hmm. can understand what things mean mm -hmm. so that any code that we make is as is understandable Not um, crazy. yeah exactly so plain language enforceable I like the enforceable portion of it um, and uh, there was a third thing I was thinking about um, that should be in there. and I, I think that an overall directive we can is our code will have will be yep. plain language searchable enforceable searchable. Um, and th applicable exactly but not overbearing but I, I, right. it shouldn't be too, right. too rough on people but it can be enforceable but then we have to enforce it you know not not only legally enforceable uh, but we may have to look at uh, the community service officers who's going to go out and, and, uh, and do this work well, so first oh. of all you have you have to ask yourself do you do you want to have codes like we have now that are so overly encompassing on every aspect of everything that you could probably look for a week to find somebody in, in non-compliance on something somewhere mm -hmm. well, that is so it. trivial that it really doesn't even matter right. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean I think the code really needs to be shortened up tightened up to the things that really matter I mean kind of a pick your battles situation but exactly. do, we want, do we want our people to be proactive reactive or non-active well, it depends what your code is. If your code is going to be like it is right now where it's broad encompassing, they can't be proactive yep. because that would be the only thing they ever do. You'd have to take every resource we have right now and then double it and that's all they would do because it's just so much stuff out there that's mm -hmm. everywhere. I, I really like the way we handle our code right now yep. for the most part. I like the complaint-based code because that allows – because – where you live is different than my neighborhood. Where you live is different mm -hmm. than my neighborhood, and it kind of allows self-policing. Exactly, and it and it reduces the amount of police work that we need to do on things. And I, I really like. Uh, I know, like, for example, we're going through garbage carts, and some folks are extremely whooped up about the fact that garbage carts, per code, aren't supposed to be stored in front of visible from the street or whatever that right. is. Um, I myself, I couldn't care less if I see a garbage cart or not. I mean, we don't want them overflowing on the curb, but some neighborhoods, it is it, the character of the neighborhood. You don't want to be able to see them. So those neighborhoods, they should be able to enforce them if they want to, um, if they, that neighborhood character needs that. My neighborhood, nobody would really care. Mm -hmm. there, I mean, that's a good point. And if I could just focus on one other task issue. I mean, one of the things that we don't receive complaints on, but what happens is the little plastic cardboard signs that appear on corners, I mean, those are technically illegal. We don't do a very good job of enforcing those. We don't get people to complain about it. What happens then is that, well, if, if they can do it, then I'm going to do it, and yep. pretty soon you get a carpet bombing of these out there. I mean, that's something that we could send the sign patrol out and remove those. Uh, you'll probably hear about it, uh, but that's one that, I mean, as oh, a city, oh, well, you're going to have to and it decide creates, whether you're going to enforce it or not. It creates traffic problems because those people who put the signs out park right there right. and and it's like right. how are we well, supposed to get around it's here? not to say i mean we're not going to if someone's got a garage sale on the weekend it's technically that's I understand that. one of those i but see more of the real you see a lot of commercial ones too. mark, mark i think another example would be that that newspaper mailing thing that we sat down at one time and talked with these people and got nowhere with they, they're still thrown in everybody's yards they sit at the curb they get pushed out on the curb they get flushed down to the drain what are we seriously? What are we going to do? You did a good job of fixing that. I mean, you did. It, People you are supposed fixed to be able to opt out. I haven't heard complaints. Yeah. Yeah. Help, but they're still doing it. You know, you well, can't. If you order a newspaper, they're doing it, but they're not doing it to everyone. I don't order one. It's still thrown at the curb. I, I just huh. get, I pick it up and throw it in a garbage can because I don't want it. I but, know. but you know, we're not going to set every resource we no. have on walking around the whole city and picking up every single one. It's just ridiculous. We're not going to do that. It's not cost effective, and it's not that big of a deal. Just so pick it up and throw it away. Can Maybe. I read a directive? I've, I've been made jotting notes as you've all been discussing. I was going to add one thing to it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we want to add this into the directive or not, but have um, complaint-based 
non-safety code enforcement. I don't know if that makes sense to have to clearly say, I don't what we're actually going to do. Mm -hmm. So that helps council know where we're okay. going. A, simp a simple so code that serves the citizens and the city in the in this mm -hmm. community that they live in. Can sure. can I make this a little broader? Please. Because sure. the code is exactly the key that drives this whole thing. So if you developed or enhanced, you can pick your term. City documents to guide staff and elected officials to make decisions in a consistent, manageable, and well-guided process allowing elected officials to respond in a clearly defined manner. I mean, it's long, it's wordy, we can, we can tweak it, but is that what you're looking for? No, I was talking about the code. But this is a city document. City documents start with the code. Then you're gonna get into all the other well, pieces that you, you have to make your decisions based on. But it's not for us to make decisions, it's for the residents that live in our community to know what the expectation is. But it's you are the, often approached as a council right. to make a determination on, is that what the code says? But is it for the elected officials or for, is it for? For the community. What yeah. would you For the community. Excuse me. Okay. Could you read that again for okay. me? Okay. Uh, you can develop or enhance, take your pick, city documents to guide the community. Would you rather instead of having staff and elected officials to guide the community? Mm -hmm. Okay in making decisions that are consistent, manageable, and well-guided. So I can, I can read that document and decide how I'm gonna vote on yeah, something? Yeah, the, the community's not gonna make that decision, so. Well, if we're gonna put community in there, I think then the last part needs to change right, community so guidance to the elected official in the. Okay, is, are we going yeah. down the road? Really is this a directive you would want to have in place? Would this be? Or do you want something as defined in a directive that says the city code shall? That's the question I'm asking. How defined do you want these directives? How, or do you want them broader so they're more applicable to a lot of the things you are working with? Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe city documents, cause I like the plain language portion of it. Mm -hmm. cause I, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that would lead, cause the whereas is drives me crazy. I know. Um, and I know that's the way all cities do it, but it drives me nuts because um, I don't understand what the point of having the whereas is, is because tradition. I know, but what's the point? <laughs> I know uh, that's not plain it, language to me. It, it doesn't. Well, got English pen out if you want to go back. Or yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Matt does a very nice does. script. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I, you're right, Julie. We should or could expand that to city documents. Um, because one of the things you really, I think you, as I look around this community, the thing that I think you've really tapped into in the last year and a half is a strong emphasis on communication, a strong em emphasis on giving people information quickly, accurately, understandable, hoping that if there are things, this garbage situation is an exact example, getting a response out there to people who are confused, getting responses out to people who don't understand, it kind of goes back to that whole process of the city documents. Is that a directive mm -hmm. that you want to keep making a priority or am I totally off the mark on this? Are there things that are of a higher level to you that you think are more critical to put into a directive? Well, it sounds like it could be a good directive. There are other higher ones too. Right, but, uh, that's why I'm just I think you had it pretty much the first time. City code should be a clear, concise, and understandable and searchable. I, and I think you can have that to city documents can be clear, right. concise, understandable, and searchable. Yeah. I mean, that, Aren't and that city documents already clear, concise, oh except no. for the city code. The whereas. No. Right. Well, the, oh, that would take the code, that broad, would take yeah. ordinance, that would take memos, that would take communication with residents. I mean, that would be As city things documents. things on your Facebook, that's going to be things on your city website. It's yeah. across the board. We shouldn't, not that I mind, but when somebody calls and says, you know, I'm on the city's website looking at the city code, and I am not understanding what's telling me. We get that a lot. So I start looking at it, and I'm like, you're not alone. No. And they're and like, well, <laughs> you made it. And I'm like, no, well, not really, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like know, these are the little bring it up. you inherited. Right, keep yeah. in mind, a lot of the city code language came as a result of discussions like tonight, the same way we're trying to mm -hmm. get something put into A, B, C, D, and E, mm -hmm. and if you make it too encompassing, then it sort of loses the directness and the direction 
and that's mm -hmm. the problem we have now. Right. Our existing code is so expansive that we really need to pick our battles, as Kathy it's said. Rather concise, yeah. We need yeah. to really bring it in. A lot of our law enforcement activities are state statute enforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they already have 105 reasons to pull you over. Right. So, so I mean, we're looking at you know how big can your campfire be? Mm -hmm. You know where. Where what you can and can't store outside, how long deep your grass can be, you know, pretty simple stuff. Unfortunately, just doing a city code that says people need to use common sense doesn't right. always right. work. Right. Well, no. I know. But we have to come up with a rule. As well. I suppose we could put a paragraph there: a traffic should stop where that says stop at the stop sign. Nobody does. So how about okay? You want to try another run at first? Will you read your first one sure. again for me see what I'm missing? Because I kind of reworded it a little. Develop or enhance city documents to provide clear, concise, understandable information and respond to the questions and concerns of the citizens. So to respond. And respond. I don't to know. respond. Yeah. So I kind of took what you mm -hmm. what you have and put it in, okay, shoot that put back it in plain language. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have create or amend city documents that are concise, use plain language, and I'm not sure what the next bullet point Searchable. is. Trackable, retrievable. Uh, so plain language accessible. to me and accessible. Yeah, well, plain language to you, plain language to me, plain language to Michael Leake is three different <laughs> answers. It really is. You, you're right. Um, but there is, I mean, there is very clear, I know there's clear guidance from a state level as to what plain language is. I mean, from a legal level, there's guidance intent. as to what plain language is. Because mm -hmm. legislature has to have used plain language. Legislative I mean, intent. I think it's, what, a sixth? Intent. Well, it's like a sixth grade level or eighth grade level mm -hmm. of... Uh, of communication and words and, and those kinds of things. So it can be defined, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we need to go that far. We'll go I don't grade. think we need to go that deep because Smarter there than a fifth grade, better go for it. <laughs> there it is. So uh, <laughs> is this overall a directive that you think is important to bring forward into our, yeah, let's into our so. planning? Does everything have to be done by a directive, or can council just like do No, it does not. These are guides, these rules, yeah, right. insights. Guides, and yeah. these show people who we are and yeah. what, what, we, what we believe in. As a council, and what you, you were dealing them. with at a point in time—that's the other piece of this—is right. you are dealing with a lot of issues that change in time. Could you just reread what you did? Okay, yep. create or amend city it. documents, which create understandable. Create or amend city documents that are concise, use plain language, mm -hmm. and accessible. I like that. Mm -hmm. And are accessible. And I don't know. We can wordsmith are that. Are accessible. Does that miss uh, anything Michael. that you had in there? <laughs> Does that miss anything that you had That's in there, what Julie? I'm going back here. Accessible um, and understanding. Accessible, understandable. do you want to define to whom? Oh, that would be clear and concise. To all. To all. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. That's almost We're going to read this Matt. back. Can you all live with this? This is number four. Create or yeah. amend city documents that are concise, use plain and understandable language, or just plain language? Or is that clear enough? Plain yeah, language. Plain is if you take good. understandable, then people could. Then it's just all good. Okay. Yeah. You're just plain. And plain. are Twisted accessible and, and are accessible to all. Yes. Mm -hmm. End of discussion. Are you good yeah. with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We like it. That's number four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, Jay, you mentioned. Now, okay, Matt, first off, does that meet what you're looking for when you are concerned about the city code? Yep. Did that meet that need? Okay. Yep. Jay, you said there were higher priorities. Oh, I guess well, I'm asking I, I, you. I just thought there probably were higher, and you were going to tell yeah, us about those. But I, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> as a council, and the thing that's been fun, because as we were gearing up for this, and obviously I have no life because I think this is fun, as I'm reviewing the notes back from February, I'm going, you guys have dealt with an incredible amount of issues since February, since you've had those baptism backfires. Are there directives that come to your mind that you maybe didn't even consider back in February and January? that now surface as I wish I had had some type of a directive that would give me and the council and the community a clear message on what we're doing and why. I'd like to find a, a create a cost cutting committee within each department, not the highest and not the lowest, but the middle of the road employees that are willing to volunteer to this and 
to look for for efficiencies, not necessarily cutting the service out, but to look to for efficiencies to pass that savings on to the taxpayers. But is this a policy that we're? Th that's a task. Why do you want to do that? Because I want to turn that, that savings on to the taxpayer. That was nearly a directive. So look look for efficiencies. Was it? Or using staff to look for efficiencies in the way we do business? I want to open it up to our, our employees, not look. necessarily our department heads. I want to create a, mm -hmm. a working group within each department. I mean, if I walked into Public Works and asked, asked the middle of the road employee, he or she, time waster and the what yeah yeah if, if we did that they would have a list mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know I, I, I don't want to give it to higher staff staff heads because they have things to do already I want that group to develop these things themselves and bring them forward and take ownership so create a, a working environment that allows for efficient ideas to be brought forth for cost savings and, uh, and efficiencies you know, so and some of these, some I'm sure there's employees out there that got ideas that are bad ideas, mm -hmm. but they just may not be looking at it from a different perspective. Somebody could leapfrog onto that bad idea and come up with a, a wonderful one. So as right, you are sorry. thinking, like if you're in budget planning, I actually, uh, actually, I do this with my staff as we sit down and look at budgets. I meet with the city clerk's department, I meet with the finance well, department. Well, I don't know why it wouldn't be an ongoing thing. It's just oh, but it is, because budget planning is year round. You know, it, be, uh, it makes for a more efficient mm -hmm. workforce. It makes for a for an ownership uh, workforce, um, and it, it creates accountability between the folks that are paying the workforce mm -hmm. and the workforce. Yeah. I mean, this group is paid for by this group, and now this group is looking at this group who is trying to be as efficient as possible. It's a synergy. So what directive I don't know why they wouldn't do that. would you want to create, if any, on this I concept? Think, what I think you're getting at, at least from what my experience is, is uh, cult, like a lean management culture, yeah. culture of constant improvement mm -hmm. type things. Right. Um, where you're consistently, uh, Kaizen is the Japanese uh, um, business culture, where you're consistently looking for new ways of doing things to get at those efficiencies Correct. and to get at those. So it's a lean management thing? Well, it could be an existing way too. I, m to me, it might be the same thing because I'm not familiar with Japanese, but it would be the Six Sigma of, mm -hmm. of yeah. PE. It's right. That's exactly yeah. what it's we're talking about. It's the same here. concept. Yep. Um, so that, started I think off with Deming. What's that? He, Edward Deming, started it in, in mm -hmm. Japan and it's blown up since then. Exactly. There's many different looks at it. So. So is it a, a thing like it does a culture of consistent improvement? Does that constant improvement? Is that something that gets yeah. at? I what? think it's a policy. Establish I mean, a culture know. of documented and, in, and hang on, I'm writing this down before it goes out of my head. Walk me through this as I'm saying this, Matt. Develop a culture that encourages and expects expects constant review Continu and improvement continuous improvement yeah. continuous improvement well Continu you're almost telling that they're that they're not good enough you know and that's not the message i'm well, trying to send I, I, so I would don't read it as not good enough i think continuous yeah. improvement is kind of what you expect out of your own life yeah I mean, I can see that as You're a real positive, stationary. Matt. I, I can. Yeah. I think we need independent review of any of those uh, ideas because absolutely, you get uh, if you send it up to your department manager, and they poo-poo it for a year and sit on it, and then all of a sudden it becomes their idea, and they're the big brainiac that right. came up with it when they actually took it from the guy down below. But that's the I've culture. seen that happen too many that's times. Mark's role. That's, not that's, our that's role. what Mark well, does. I mean, though. It, it we do that in something. budget. This is something that the council is looking at as an organizational goal. You know, that's you give us the direction to do that, and we'll get that done. I certainly agree. I but mean, it's going to involve everyone. You at the uh, last workshop, you heard Stacy from uh, 
first stop shop talk about creating mm -hmm. you know, good customer service. Mm -hmm. That's part of what we need to do to improve then to make sure that everyone from businesses coming in to the residents that are in town are assured uh, that they're going to be able to call City Hall and get good, concise answers. The cultural improvement sorts of things, there's no reason that that can't be a base level, and each year we find ways to set goals to improve on that. But I, so think, I think what's really important in this process is not to have a individual come up with an idea and submit it to their department head to sit on it and decide whether it goes more. My intent was to have a person would volunteer from each department, somewhere in the middle level, not the newest guy that just mm -hmm. got hired last week, mm -hmm. or not the department head, mm -hmm. where they all meet together mm -hmm. once a month or twice a month or something mm -hmm. and float their ideas because maybe their mm -hmm. own group. Right. Well, I get what you're saying, but I, I think what maybe Mark is getting to is are, are you asking those people then to report to Mark? Because you don't want the department head. So there has to be a continua, or a right. constant well, person. Well, let's say you've got a group of 20 that meet right. one, twice a month or something, and this person has an idea, and they float it with the group, and the, this group of that group, mm -hmm. most of them look at it from a different perspective that that person didn't look at, and they agree that maybe their idea wasn't so good. I, th I think you're getting in the weeds on a program, and mm -hmm. I think we need a policy. Okay. okay. Can I, can I pop something out from the words I'm hearing? I'm throwing right. words together as we're doing this. Develop a culture that encourages continuous improvement through internal process review and provide a forum for discussion and resolution. Right, All right. Yeah. that's that what works. I was thinking, yeah. Are you, are you comfortable you? with that? I'll read it again. You tell me if there's pieces of here that just don't fit or there's pieces we're completely missing. Develop a, now this is where you might want to expand on this, a city-wide culture or a, is there something you need before? Organizational culture. Sure. Provide, yeah. Develop yeah. an yeah. organizational culture that encourages continuous improvement through internal process review, providing a forum for discussion and resolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could even expand that out to having some input from citizens if you wanted to go <coughs> deeper on it. And that can kind of be your subset. You know, who, who are you working with? And, and right. you're right. There's your a very broad base of people. Well, I think we already have that option because we have that on the on the uh, website yeah, side. The you got an idea box. Right. You got public forum. You've mm -hmm. got a number of yeah. sites that they can participate in. But if you get the word off. And now, once we start this culture, we can take our our information box, our idea box, and we can turn some of them back over to this group right. for consideration. Yeah, and they can perfect. maybe take that idea and they have mm -hmm. a way to facilitate But then that. we celebrate those successes and those winners of the good ideas get a ride on the recumbent bike. I mean, you don't have to give, oh, them, yes. <laughs> you don't have to wow. give them the name of the person that submitted it unless they gave it to us. Well, you've you got to you yeah. encourage the, the use of it and celebrate the, the wins. And, and um, I mean, if you're, if you're worried about a department that's taking an idea from someone and using it, I think you need to celebrate the person that comes up with a wonderful idea and make that public. Yeah. I think right. that's the key there is you don't get them both ways. You, you call Christetta roll. down and say, hey. What I hear is, I mean, we want to do employee empowerment. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. We can yes. certainly yes. do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking with a colleague just last week on this and how they've done that mm -hmm. with their organization, and it has made improvements. Now, every once in a while, people have to be reminded that, well, it may be a great idea, but ultimately someone's responsible for that whether that's you know the department head or the city administrator or you as the elected mm -hmm. officials, mm -hmm. you need to do that. So you know it doesn't always work that I can make a decision, I can stand alone on that, but it's still something that can permeate the organization. And I'm, I'll be happy to get some information for you as far as how w what a step would be to start to get that implemented. Well, I know there's a lot of programs out there and, there really and um, everybody on the street, every corner might have one that's gonna sell you a quality program, but not, so sure we're ready to invest in a program. I'm not looking program, to go buy a uh, program. This is something, this is a common sense right, thing. Yeah. So we can do this in house. If I'm hearing what you're saying, Matt, what you're looking at is to make sure there's value in each employee's perspective, idea, suggestion, and make sure that goes somewhere. Is that kind of it in summary? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I'm looking at how do we create efficiencies, cost savings efficiencies. Right. I'm not looking at the other side of an em every employee that wants their, their own city vehicle or their own whatever. Right. 
I'm looking for efficiencies <coughs> that make their job easier, exactly. cost less, exactly. and make everybody's function easier. For the betterment of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I throw something out? Uh -huh. Sorry, I've been listening, and I added one little piece mm -hmm. to it. I'm writing. Um, so I have invest in a culture, technology, and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. But I'm looking to save money, not spend money. Well, it will. I mean, if you, but so if training will save will you save money. Save training will always Just save you money. And that customer yeah. service piece But I think too. we already train. Um, not, really. not not to the level that We're many organizations our do. No, we don't. So we do if you took more. our percentage of dollars spent on training in one year and compared it to the city's budget, it is very minimal. It is really small. And I think you would have some efficiencies if you had spent it on that. I, th I know I'm within my that department. Stuff. That's one of the pieces I'm working on. That right. We have people who are getting networked with other people so they stop recreating the wheel. Right. In an organization our size, you can't do a continuous improvement program without help i mean it's not something mm -hmm. we can expect mark just to hey mark go out and start this for us without any no i'm expecting that each department head would take their their respective department have a meeting and say anybody that works in this department want to volunteer to sit on a committee to to talk about any efficiencies or cost cutting measures that would make everything yeah. easier so why them. do you I've think this doesn't happen right now i mean why, why I mean, maybe it does i don't know mm -hmm. if it doesn't Let's do it. If it does, then we just wasted a bunch of time. Well, I, I think, think you're getting at no. A, I think you're getting at a very at a valid really important point. thing. I do, I do too. I, I, I have a different frame of reference for it than you do, um, but let me read what I wrote again and tell yep. me if what. Yep. So invest in a culture, technology, and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. I think you might be hung up on the invest part. Can we pick another uh -huh. one? Well, I think we're, we want to utilize what we have right now. Mm -hmm. We don't need to put a whole lot more into it. Let's see what we get out of it without a big investment. We've, we've put an we're investment in all these We're not saying it's going to be people. a big investment, though. Right. It's just a, sometimes investment is just resources. the time you spend, resources time. that it doesn't mean HR. necessarily dollars. Yeah. Investment is, is twofold. Yeah, that's all we're, we're going with that. Providing just the time to employees. Now, that's mm -hmm. an interesting thing. Exactly. How about we empower our employees to... Uh, we empower our employees and encourage our our uh, workers or whatever to help guide our efficiencies. Okay, where would you fit that in? When is that is that something you could fit in with what the mayor just read? At one point, I got a stack. I can't remember what year it was and what the reasoning was. It was probably five years ago, but we got a stack of from various city employees of imp things that. Would it could be changed that would save the city money? That was in 2008. We went I found it, that we went file. Through it, we went through mm -hmm. it, and we went through it, and I don't know what we ever did with it. So maybe somebody implemented some of it. Mm -hmm. I don't we know. We did that for the 2013 budget. But, but in uh, 2008, that was a file that was created as far as the budget process when there were some significant issues relating to we knew the down was coming. That, that should be an ongoing mm -hmm. thing. And how we do that, okay. you know, that should be just an ongoing but thing. I, but I think that statement that we started would get that going. Right, the continuous improvement. So, something to go along with that, though. If somebody uh -huh. puts in a, you know, submits an idea, they should get an answer back one way or the other. If it's something that's sure. unworkable, explain to sure. them why it's unworkable. You know, they might think yeah, it's the best idea. Yeah, purchase a piece of equipment that will save this much time, but it would be completely out of the schedule of an equipment plan. I mean, well, that's the what you're saying. Part of it again, not I'll give you an example on a state level, just so it's out of our realm. The state requires when they did my street in front of my house, they tear it all up for a distance. They pull the pipes out of the ground. It's break time for the day. They cover it all back up. They come back the next morning. They tear the same trench back open. They lay some pipe down. They close it back up. They come back the next day, they open up the same piece of trench, continue on with the pipe, and it's like, how inefficient is that? It's ridiculous, and that's why these road projects cost millions of dollars, okay? It's because the people at the state, so if you get there, you can fix this mess. The, uh, the state, I'll call it really, think about it. Put up that yellow six-foot fencing around the thing with a couple signs on it that say if you fall in the pit and break your leg, you're on your own. Don't enter this site. It's a, it's a government construction site. Do not enter. 
you're not authorized, it's like a military base. If you enter, orders are to shoot. Let's put that on that. So if we look at something, if we look at something local, and you're saying really empower empower employees and our team to do this kind of thing, you two guys wouldn't be getting paper packets anymore because that's a huge waste of time for staff. Mm -hmm. And if we just got you guys iPads, it would save hours and hours and hours of time Mm -hmm. every single week to get you the the information digitally as opposed to a paper packet. Is that what you want? And the paper packet cost and the man hours cost compared to the iPad and teach me how to work it. It's much better. Well, the teaching you how to work it, that's, nobody knows the answer to that one. Um, but that's what I'm saying is, is if you're really, if you're really, if that is really what you want to have happen, that's one of the things that would be a huge low hanging fruit that would save hours of time oh, yeah. every single week. But I don't work for the city per se. I, I'm not, I'm not a everyday you know, maintenance operator. But that is one of the first things one of the staff members would say is get that guy an iPad to... uh, But I think what you're trying to say is that one man's, you know, fruit is another man's poison on this Mm -hmm. one. I mean, you appreciate having something paper. I mean, I do too at times um, to look at. That is an extra cost. We try to accommodate everybody on that. Sometimes when you're in government, you have to prioritize. You have to make tougher decisions. And so whether it's paper packets or whether it's you know what? Uh, how big we have street signs out there mm-hmm. because you know the state now says it's got to be larger than what it used to be. How quickly do you go into that? Mm-hmm. That's your that's your call as an investor in, in the community as a decision maker. It's more important to me that the employees that we have in the city know deep in their heart that if they see that they can make an improvement to their community, that they have that ability to do that mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. That's the Absolutely, culture. that's what but we're that's trying the to culture. get. At. I think we're all on the same page. So what would you want instead of invest? So blah, blah, blah in a culture, technology, and training that expects continuous improvement, so increasing efficiencies, and no less than the highest levels of customer service. How about, I don't like the term embrace a culture, um, develop. I don't think we're creating a culture. No, you're not really creating. Or maybe Um, adapt. Encourage a culture. Encourage is wash wishy washy. Okay. It's it's not encourage. It, Reward this a is culture. Wha- Establish a culture. Yeah. 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 How about that? I got a question Create. as far Maintain. as the iPads go. <laughs> <laughs> what? I got a question as far as uh-huh. the iPads go. Yeah. Um, if we went that route, is there any chance we could get stuff Friday morning? Um, only if. I mean, we Ooh. have everything ready, but what do you say, Mark? Like last Friday. We had the majority of everything done by 11 o'clock. There was mm-hmm. one piece we were held up on by Kennedy and Graven, and that we got at 2.30. And, and we can do that, just keeping in mind that. They had the same discussion at Buck last night. Right. A couple of the guys said the same thing. Yeah. They, they were gonna, they're talking about getting the iPads, and a couple of them said, well, I'll just plug it into my printer and print it out. I got a hard copy I can scribble on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what I like with four is to get I, can I know, you on. keep your notes. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of the iPads have the ability to keep the notes on the side, yeah. and that's kind of yeah. cool, yeah, too. But could we do it? Yeah, we can put a deadline on. I've been mm-hmm. working that one for a couple months now. Draft. <laughs> put out a draft, draft version. <laughs> You're buying so, it. We're right. ready. But okay, that's so absolutely something we can get at. So Establish a culture. Could that be a start of a phrase? Establish and promote a culture. Promote a culture. Mm-hmm. I like that. Okay. Promote a culture. Um, Next phrase. The culture which expects. That, incur- that of continuous improvement. Well, I like the technology and training portion in there because okay. that says that we as a council. Promote a culture with emphasis on technology and training. Could that be workable? I think invest in a culture of technology and training is just easier. Okay. What's the rest of it? Invest in a culture of technology and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. I like the customer tr- service yeah. part of this too. Read that again. Promote or invest in a culture, comma, technology and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. Good job. Mm -hmm. One more time. More than that, does it give me a clue of what it is I'm trying to do? By empowering employees. Yes. You could add one more piece on there. By empowering employees. What what do you think it needs to say, Matt? 
So we're trying to uh, empower employees to uh, speak their create mind, create efficiencies, to right. create empower efficiencies. employees to communicate freely and effectively. To create, to empower employees to create efficiencies. Um, how about freely. create efficiencies through culture, technology, and training? Create efficiencies through. Yeah. So. Say it again. Create efficiencies through. Efficiencies. Uh -huh. Through technology and training. Through culture, technology, and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. I like that. One more time. Create efficiencies through culture. Technology, technology and, training. and training that expects continuous improvement and no less than the highest levels of customer service. And the highest levels of customer. No less than the highest levels of customer service. This is what we expect today. Yeah. Exactly. But, but you're defining it, and I, I like I've that. Started <laughs> 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 I started rewriting I think That's I've got point, it. Matt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if I read this back. He's going to pull out a pen. He's going to write it on paper. Create, create, oh, he's a, typing. create efficiency through, culture, through a culture. culture. We're all not there. Like through a culture. Of technology, of technology and training. And training. Show where the not is. of technology. Just culture. Through culture, comma, technology, and training. Yep. Right? Culture, technology, and training. Right. That expects that continuous expects improvements and the highest level of customer service. And no less than the highest levels of customer service. Yeah. Got it. That's right. Can you live with that, guys? Very well. At 10 p.m., can you live with that? Mm -hmm. Looks good. That gives us five. Does it get after what I'm trying to accomplish? Create it will. Yes. It Create efficiencies. will. All right. And I understand very clearly what you're saying, and that's right. the interesting part here as we talk about this departmentally. You want to make sure that all levels of the employee base are not restrained from making suggestions that would provide a environment of possible change, cost efficiencies, different practices, updated programs that will ultimately serve the city best. From a staff level, that should be easy to sell, that overarching. You know, it's, 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 it's a good feeling for employees yeah. to Your know that at any point they can say the what trenches. they need to to, to mm -hmm. the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I think it's there. We'll add those two. We'll we've update that. Two and a half. Five. No, we got five. Well, we've got two and a half on our way to five. We can't say what Matt's gonna have, what's gonna happen when we get to the okay. council meeting next, right, Matt? Okay. Right. All right. No, <laughs> Matt's a go-to guy here. And I, I expect this to be on consent. Does anybody have a problem with that? We'll see. Well, he can take it off of consent <laughs> if you yeah, want. Yeah, you to, can. But I, we'll we'll route it through consent. consent. Is there Kay. any uh, other piece of this that you all or anyone feels strongly about that we need to bring forward? With that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. To June 17th at 7 p.m. I'll accept that amendment. Do we have a second? I'll second. Second, Councilman Mogul. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. I'm really comfortable right here right you now. You look good. Passes, <laughs> look, passes look four to one with Councilman Layman in dissent. All right, I guess I'll get off. I'll get off.